Two Super Speedways this year in Grand National competition. The most recent victory at Darlington last weekend. The real race at Darlington, though, was for second place. The principals, Daryl Waltrip and Tim Richmond. Tim went a lap down early, but charged back up to challenge Daryl. These two drivers are the principals in today's race here at North Wilkesboro, North Carolina Speedway, a track only a little over one half mile in length. Last year in this race, several drivers were battling for the lead, but late in the competition, Richmond led the parade out of the pit area, and Tim hung on for his only Winston Cup win of 1984. He beat Harry Gant by one half second. Waltrip finished sixth here last year. The clean-cut Ohio boy, after stealing the money from the Northwestern Bank 400, cleverly disguised himself. And today, we'll be racing back to that bank, this time incognito, to try to enter the vault again. the brushy mountains of North Carolina, but thousands of race fans have gathered here for the running of the Northwestern Bank 400 at North Wilkesboro, North Carolina Speedway. The temperature, well, it's going to be in the 90s today. Later this afternoon, there is very little chance of rain, there's very little wind, and also very little humidity, so a great day for racing. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bob Jenkins, along with Larry Newber. When you talk about the North Wilkesboro, North Carolina Speedway, you think of Junior Johnson and Darrell Waltrip. Junior's shops are just down the road, and Darrell Waltrip has won eight times here. His pole position for this race is his ninth. Well, you know, Darrell has changed his appearance also several times in the last couple of years. The hairstyle, of course, a lot of us have done that. But no matter what Darrell looks like when he comes here, he is, always seems to be the favorite. A matter of fact, among those wins, six of those wins have come in the last eight races. So when you think of favorites at North Wilkesboro, I guess you got to think of Darrell. Bill Elliott has dominated the super speedway so far this year, but this is a track a little more than one half mile in length. He has never won here. As a matter of fact, there are only four former winners in the field today. Well, you know, Bob, this is one of the oldest tracks on the circuit, and I think that points out the fact that you really need experience to do well here. Not only do uh, you have to have that experience, and we have so few winners that are in the crowd, but also this is like the rubber match. Chrysler, or the, rather the General Motors products have won three times, the Ford products have won three times this year, and this might be the rubber match. But then again, the weather might be the biggest factor today. And let's get more on that situation as we switch to our pit reporter, the guy who has the hot assignment for it this afternoon. Here is Jack Aroot. That'll be an understatement, Bob and Larry. It's going to get hot down here, and the heat may be a factor, a critical factor in the race. First of all, if it does get very hot, that could favor the Ford products, although they're not as strong on the short tracks as they've been on the super speedways. But more importantly, we've been measuring the track temperatures. We've inserted this probe, and you'll be surprised, but it's been 135 degrees right here as they fire the engines. That'll be a problem for drivers and crew chiefs alike here on pit road. It could get to be very hot down here very shortly, and we'll be covering it all right down here for the Northwestern Bank 400. Back to Larry and Bob. Thank you, Jackie. The Northwestern Bank 400 is being brought broadcast booth, and we are riding with Kyle Petty. We have two cameras in the car, one that'll show us the racetrack, and Kyle, right now, we're looking at you. What's going through your mind right now? Right now, we're just trying to get, get the tires seated in, get the right seated back in, warm the car up a little bit, get ready to race, I guess. All right, Kyle, thank you, and we'll be talking to you and watching your pictures throughout the afternoon. Now let's look at the starting lineup for today's Northwestern Bank 400. On the pole, car number 11, the Budweiser Chevrolet from Franklin, Tennessee. Darrell Waltrip outside, Terry Labonte in the Piedmont Airlines Chevrolet. Row two, Bobby Allison in the Miller American Buick. And Kyle Petty, car number seven, the 711 Ford. In the third row, Neil Bonnet in the Budweiser Chevrolet. Outside row number three, Ron Bouchard in the Valvoline Buick. The field comes down and the green flag flies. The race is underway. We'll give you the rest of the starting lineup in just a moment. The cars go through corners number one and two. Labonte right alongside Darrell Waltrip as they race down the backstretch and go into turn number three. But that inside groove is just a little bit faster than the outside groove. And Darrell Waltrip will have the lead as they come off of the corner four. So Wallace... Rather, Darrell Waltrip leading lap number one, followed by Labonte, then Kyle Petty, then Ron Bouchard, Bobby Allison, Dale Earnhardt, Neil Bonnet, Rusty Wallace, and Bill Elliott. 
Bob, this is the hottest race on record for the spring race here at North Wilkesboro. And it's very likely that the weather and tire wear will be a factor in the race today. Something to watch for. A guy can be very fast at certain stages of the race, but he may be punishing the car, and in particular the tires, just too much. So no matter who is leading at what point in the race, it may not be the best idea. While we continue to watch the race out there, and Daryl Waltrip leading Terry Labonte, the rest of the starting lineup, Rusty Wallace and Dale Earnhardt in row four. Fifth row was Jeff Bodine and Bill Elliott. Sixth row, Richard Petty and Buddy Baker. Row seven, Ricky Rudd and Lake Speed. Eighth row, Harry Gant and Bill Parsons. Ninth row, Dave Marcus and Tim Richmond. The tenth row, Bobby Hillen and Clark Dwyer. Eleventh row, Ken Schrader and J.D. McDuffie as we're now inside Kyle Petty's car. Twelfth row, Jimmy Means and Buddy Arrington. Thirteenth row, Eddie Bershwell and Don Hume. Then Bobby Gerhardt and Brent Elliott in row number four. In row 15, Ed Sanger and Dick May. Well, Bob, this may be the best chance of all for this year for Kyle Petty, whose car we're inside right now. Now they're moving through turns three and turn four. You see Kyle pinching it down low coming out of turn number four. You drive this track kind of like a super speedway. You let the car swing out, particularly on a hot track like this. It's going to be a little more slippery than normal. You see him pinching turn number two. Now letting the car slide out as close as you feel comfortable to the backstretch wall. Then you go into turn three. This is the corner you can really pinch tight because you're going uphill and centrifugal force does not try to throw you off the track as much as it does in turns one and two. Right behind him is Ron Bouchard and the Valvoline Buick right behind Kyle Petty who is running in third position and he has well, about five or six car lengths between himself and Terry Labonte who's running in second. But now bon Ron Bouchard pulling right up on the back bumper of Kyle Petty as they went through the third turn. Bill Elliott gets a little sideways coming out of turn number four and loses a couple of positions. The rear end on that car just going sideways. Elliott now to the inside of the track. He was running in ninth position, but is slowing down. Bobby's slowing down significantly. You know, this car has been very fast, particularly in the super speed. Was, I guess it's just that he was a little out of shape. He felt the slipperiness of the racetrack. He decided to get out of the throttle. That is tough on tire wear. And as we mentioned, as this track heats up today, remember under any yellow fly condition, you can only change two tires as we look at Elliott's performance on the super speedways this year. When he didn't win, he crashed. When you heat up the tires here, because you can only change two in any green flag conditions or yellow flag conditions, you may be in trouble. And the interesting graphic that followed that, five victories in the last 11 races. There he is, the Dawson Bill Georgia native Bill Elliott. Well, there there's is a guy trying to make a move, Bob. Richard Petty there on the, in, on the outside in car number 43, and on the inside is, Rich, is Tim Richmond. Remember that Richmond won this race from way back in 17. Whoa, he gets in the lake a little bit, quite a little bit. They're out of shape there in turn three, turn four. Coming down the inside, Tim drops way down on the entrance level, almost to the pit area to get underneath Lake Speed. That was 12th, 13th, and 14th, so you can tell what kind of an afternoon we're in for here on these short tracks that the Grand National drivers compete on. There's a lot of bumping, banging, and if a particular driver is in front of you and uh, you want him out of there, they'll do a little bit of bumping. Tim Richmond moves into 12th place. Right behind him is Lake Speed, and then Buddy Baker and Richard Petty are running side by side. Well, of course, Lake Speed started in 14th position, so he has primarily held his position, although he has moved ahead of both Richard and Buddy Baker. There's Phil Parsons trying to move to the inside. Buddy Baker, of course, in the white number 88. Richard and Buddy started 11th and 12th. They had very good second day qualifying runs. They were mired back around 20th position after qualifying runs on Friday, but really moved up during yesterday's sessions. And another indication of the heat that we have had here all weekend since Friday when qualifying began, the uh, qualifying speed of Daryl Walter, who was on the pole, 111.899 miles an hour. That's almost four miles an hour slower than the track record. There is Bill Parsons in car number 17, who is trailing Richard Petty back in the field, running in the 14th position. Bill Parsons, of course, runs this particular car, the blue and white number 17 of Roger Hamby, only on the short tracks. They put together a new program this year, so he jumps in and out of different machines depending upon the size of the racetrack. And actually, concerning all those changes, Bob, I think they've done reasonably well. There is the younger brother of Benny Parsons, of course, who is one of our broadcasting colleagues, running in 17th place right now, but he's really held his own because there has been some shuffling in the back of the pack, primarily because Tim Richmond has begun to move his way through the field. So Bill Parsons hold his own with Richard Petty and Buddy Baker, a couple of real veterans. 
Buddy Baker running in 15th position. This is his own team this year. And we had an opportunity to talk with him and ask him about him intimidating slower cars on the racetrack. Is this a racetrack, Buddy, during the heat of the battle where you have to use the car to intimidate a slower machine? Uh, you mean lay on them or hit them? Yeah, it happens. And uh, the biggest thing is that you're going to have a certain amount of contact. You have to remember that nobody's out here on a kamikaze mission. And if you get leaned on or you lean on somebody, you have to just kind of roll with the punches unless it's a direct hit, and then it gets your dander up. But uh, the good race drivers up here, like Darrell Walter, uh, he takes his time with, with everybody. If he's racing a good car, he don't just run in there and turn him around and racetrack. Well, there's some pretty good tempers in this business. Uh, uh, you wouldn't want to do that to Bobby Allison either. So what I'm saying in so many words is you have to use a lot of uh, what you've learned through the years to, to win at these type of racetracks and uh, use a little more patience than normally you would, and, and uh, you'll end up winning, and you won't know why. It'll just come... Well, we have an accident down at the entrance to the pit area. That is Eddie Birchwell, one of the three rookie candidates in the field today. The skid marks, you can see, go right into that tire, which protects the abutment at the end of the pit wall. Birchwell sitting there in that number six car owned by D.K. Ulrich. There's a good picture of uh, Eddie. He is motioning from inside the racetrack. Someone comes over to uh, see if he is injured. And apparently no injury is involved, but the yellow flag has come out. So the cars are slowed with Daryl Waltrip still leading with uh, Terry Labonte running in second place and Kyle Petty is third. Well, the start of today's Northwestern Bank 400 brought to you race off of the racetrack. The car stopped right in the middle of the entrance to the pit area. A couple of cars did come in for a quick stop. Let's go right now again to Kyle Petty in uh, the number 711. Ford. Uh, Kyle, Bob Jenkins up again in the booth. Uh, you're hanging right in there in third position. Is the car working to your satisfaction right now? Yeah, the car is working real good right now. It's getting in the corner real good. The deal is it's a little bit loose getting the ball. We need to put about a round or two of wedge in it, but I hate to lose this position, so I'm going to stay on out of here and try to fight it until we get in to make a change on the car. Kyle, is this going to be your day? You're going to visit Victory Lane this afternoon? be watching thank you well somebody else's progress that we've been watching is Tim Richmond you know he started this race deep in the pack a year ago moved to the front and eventually win I eventually won Tim Richmond this is Larry Newber up in ESPN so far so good it looks like you're moving up like last year ah uh, yeah Larry it's looking uh, it's looking real good in the car uh, we made some changes late in practice yesterday actually after practice was over so we kind of started the race in the dark uh, but everything has seemed to turn out well. Uh, the car's handling fine. Uh, the track's starting to loosen up already, though. Uh, and we're going to have to kind of catch up and stay caught up with, uh, with the chassis. And if we do that, uh, I think we're going to have a good shot at this thing today. Well, Tim, this early caution flag gives you some more ground on the racetrack for free. Good luck for the rest of the day. Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, we'll talk to you later. Eddie Birchwell is an early out. Let's go down to Jackaroot in the pit area. Eddie, first of all, what happened? Well, uh, the car was handling real good all day. It was a little bit loose. The track was mainly looseness, but I thought I could get under J.D. and I got down a little bit low on the track, got the gas a little too quick. Just got loose and got in a bad place to get loose. I wound up on that tire over here, but I think we were doing real well. I, I was going to get them tied the car up a little bit, but, you know, it's just natural here. The track gets slick, and we just had a short day. Well, what's the feeling, though, when it when you come to a sudden stop like that? <laughs> well, it's the end of the day. <laughs> uh, that's, yeah, it wasn't really that hard of a hit. That's a pretty good tire they got. These cushions and everything, but, you know, it did damage the car. Early afternoon retirement for Eddie Birchwell, one of the rookies in the race. San Antonio, Texas, native Eddie Birchwell. So we're still under yellow, cleaning up the debris left from Birchwell's accident. And while this field is slow, we'll take this break and be right back. 
us for our live coverage of the Northwestern Bank 400 from North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. Darrell Waltrip is still in the lead, followed by Terry Labonte, car number 44. Running in third spot is Kyle Petty. In fourth, Ron Bouchard and Bobby Allison has fifth position. Now, there is Bill Elliott, who's running in 13th position, but he is having problems. This happened just a couple of seconds ago. Well, Bob, you see him up there in red and white number nine in the second lane sliding way high. You get an idea how slippery the track is. We don't even see any tire smoke. Bill is obviously sliding almost out of control. Remember in the beginning, they picked and choose their races, and for the Elliots, they did not even run the short track. So he was really lean on experience vis-a-vis -vis his career because it's just been the last couple of years that the Elliott crew has been concentrating on the short tracks as well as the big tracks. Obviously, they've been very, very fast on the big tracks this year, but right now, they've got some setup work to do before this race goes too many more laps. Well, three wins for Bill Elliott in Winston Cup competition already this year at Daytona and, of course, at Darlington, who uh, the race that we televised for you just last week. Bobby Allison and Ron Bouchard are running right behind Kyle Petty as we look from inside Kyle's race car out the back window. Bouchard and Bobby Allison are running side by side in the corner now on the inside. Bobby Allison has the advantage and picks up the position. Bobby Allison moves into fourth spot. They're going down the front stretch into turn number one, now turn number two. Bob, I'll tell you, this is a very good day for Kyle Petty up to now. He's been running quite well. He mentioned he's not particularly happy with the setup of the race car, but he is keeping the leaders right in sight, not only in sight, but within striking distance. He is only about four car lengths behind second running Terry Labonte. You see them going around the outside of Ed Sanger there, a dirt track racer from Iowa who's gotten a ride here in the Grand National Race this weekend. First time in a long, long time that Sanger has run pavement. You see the camera whipping around. There is Labonte in the upper part of your screen. You see how close Kyle Petty is to Terry Labonte. Labonte going to the outside of Dick May and putting a lap on him. There is the interval between first, second, and third. You can see Walter in the upper left part of your screen. The blue car is Terry Labonte in second, and our in-car camera being carried by Kyle Petty running in third spot. Kyle had a very good qualifying day on Friday. They have a unique system of qualifying here in North Wilkesboro. They average two days of qualifying on Friday and Saturday. And after the first day of qualifying, Kyle Petty was second quickest, but he didn't go quite as fast on Saturday, and uh, the average dropped him to a fourth place starting position. But he is looking good here in the early stages of this 400 lap race. There you can see how he's closing in very rapidly on Terry Labonte coming out of corner number four. You know, something else about the Woods Brothers, they do not have a lot of recent experience at this racetrack. Remember, we were here last year for an ESPN televised race, and in anticipation of the 1985 season, Glenn and Leonard Wood brought Buddy Baker, then their driver, to this racetrack. It was kind of a trial balloon for this race today. And I'll tell you something, I think they learned something in 1984 because Kyle is very much in the thick of it. And by this in-car camera, I think it gives you some idea of just exactly how busy a race driver is on a racetrack like this. He's just come out of the corner and now already is thinking about getting into the first corner. There you can see the footwork as he steps on the accelerator, lifts his foot off the brake, going down the back stretch. Now he'll lift the uh, gas pedal. There he does, begin to step on the brake now and slow the car down, anticipating the turn. In the middle of the turn, it's hard back on the throttle. Obviously, you don't shift, but you get an idea that both feet are always pretty busy. You know that brake pedal, they actually do use it, but it's almost as much for security feelings as it is for actually slowing the car. Kyle going to the inside of the body. I think Terry has gone to the high side of some slower traffic to try and lap some more people. Kyle gave it a look inside to see if he could get by, but definitely I would say Kyle is running on the racetrack right now faster than Terry Labonte. They're moving up around Bobby Gerhardt right now, the dirt track racer from up Pennsylvania way, now around the outside of Don Hume, and the first three leaders are staying together on the racetrack. Well, Darrell Waltrip has lengthened his advantage a little bit because of the fact that Labonte and Petty have been caught in traffic. And you can see uh, Waltrip again in the upper left portion of your screen. There are several car lengths difference between him and Terry Labonte, but Kyle Petty is right on the back bumper of Terry Labonte. They move outside and put a lap on J.D. McDuffie. Now let's go down to Jack Aroot for this report from the pit area. Bob, there's some concern in the Neil Bonnet pit about temperatures, as we said at the open. The car is beginning to show some overheating. So the crew has been running around, and they hooked up a hose to one of the water spigots here, preparing for a pit stop to cool down the radiator. But a problem developed. When they got the hose all hooked up, and they tried to squirt it, 
no water came out. So now members of the crew are running around trying to get some water under pressure for that first pit stop. When we went green from the first caution period, the Eddie Birchwell accident, and everybody else stepped on the throttle and uh, began to pick up speed, Neil didn't, and it was the vapor lock situation, but after a few minutes, the car did get back up to speed, and now Neil is uh, still on the throttle, but has lost several positions because of that problem. Just a quick update. During that caution flag, also Dale Earnhardt stopped, but you know, Dale Earnhardt has moved back up into the middle of the field. He seems to be running okay, but uh, Kind of an unexpected pit stop there early during that first yellow flag. Daryl Waltrip is the leader of the Northwestern Bank 400 at North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. We have completed 46 laps out of 400. Back with more in just a moment. Today, April 25th at 9 o'clock Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Pacific Time, live from the showboat in Las Vegas, Nevada, top rank boxing on ESPN as the top-ranked boxing delivers another fabulous fight card featured bout pits undefeated featherweight Bernard Taylor against Benji Marquise. Plus, we'll bring you our Western Division Junior Middleweight Tournament semifinals. That's Thursday, April 25th at 9 o'clock Eastern Time, top-ranked boxing on ESPN. Dale Earnhardt has moved up to 11th position. Well, remember we told you they made that pit stop underneath the yellow flag, but Earnhardt has really been moving up through the packs. And we got a spin in turn number four. It's Richmond. Richmond. Tim Rich right in the middle of everybody, people coming around, taking evasive action, and I think everybody saw him. Well, Bill Elliott, I think, <laughs> had his heart come up into his throat there because he was running in the high groove and was going pretty fast, but Bill was able to cut the car to the left and slow it down and avoid hitting Tim Richmond's spinning car. That accident also, or that spin at least, very close to where Eddie Birchwell had his spin down in corner number four. And he almost lost the lap, Bob, because he just got going under speed, his own speed again. As Darrell Waltrip came around, there were about three car lengths separating Tim from Darrell Waltrip. That was almost a very costly win, or costly spin, for the defending winner of this race. And the leaders are coming into the pits. Waltrip, Labonte, Allison, Petty, Bodine, Bouchard, Gant, Rudd, all coming in for their first pit stop of the afternoon. We will watch... Terry Labonte on the top of your screen and Daryl Waltrip on the bottom. Remember, only two tires can be changed during this caution period. If they change more than two, it's a two-lap penalty. And the two Junior Johnson Budweiser cars colliding as they come out of the pit area. But Terry Labonte oh, made it out. Somebody's Aaron wheel, yeah, is up by uh, the pit wall. I tell you, I guess that's one of the things that can happen when you have a two-car team. Of course, it may not be as big of a factor at this stage of the race on a short track, but it's the kind of thing that you really have to watch out for if you've got more than one team certainly pitted right next to one another. Several other cars coming in for pit stops as a crew member goes over and retrieves that loose wheel that went uh, clear to the pit wall, the wall separating the racetrack from the pits. Well, what a break this is for Tim Richmond. It's also a break, I think, for Bobby Allison, who was moving up. He was having trouble gaining ground on the leaders. He was running at speed. He appeared to be running maybe as fast as, perhaps a little faster, certainly, than the leader, Darrell Waltrip. But I think that uh, Bobby Allison was the first one out of the pitch. Ken Schrader, by the way, has not pitted. He appears to be the leader right now. I would imagine that he would pit if he doesn't, and he will remain the leader. Behind him would be Bobby Allison, who has pitted, and then Kyle Petty, who has also pitted. No indication, though, of Schrader coming in for a stop. So Ken Schrader is the leader at this moment, with Bobby Allison and the Miller American Buick running in second spot. We'll be right back with more from North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. Bobby Allison has gone into the lead, putting Ken Schrader back into fifth spot right now. Kyle Petty is in second, Terry Labonte in third. Then Jeff Bodine and Ken Schrader, but uh, Terry, or rather Ricky Rudd, is moving around Ken Schrader, who did not pit during that caution flag. There's Bobby Allison, though, who is shown as the leader of this race. Bobby started in third position, qualifying at 114 point, rather 111.444. Well, they've had some misfortunes, obviously, the last year, but. The team remains, as always, very optimistic. Bobby's said that, well, I've had periods like this before where I've gone through relatively dry spells, but 
real comeback last year. You had the feeling that because they were defending champions, and as you also look at Kyle Petty, that the Allison crew headed up by Gary Nelson, they were doing a lot of experimenting, but I don't think that's going on quite so much this year as it was last year. They'd like to get a pole. They certainly want to win some races, but that man right there, the blue and white 7-Eleven, number seven of Kyle Petty, he is having a tremendous day. Bobby Allison and Kyle Petty running one-two on the racetrack. Darrell Waltrip, because of that relatively slow pit stop in which he collided with Neil Bonnet, is back in about seventh position. And we had an opportunity to talk also with Darrell Waltrip, who indicated to us that the only way to survive here is stay out of trouble. Well, that's been my philosophy. Uh, my, the way I drive a race car, and, and uh, it's pretty simple, my car is just that much better than everybody else's. I'll be out front and gone. If my car's a little off or I don't feel comfortable with the way it's running, handling, whatever it may be, if something's got me a little out of sync, I'll back off, ride a while, wait for the crew to help me, wait for tires to help me, wait for wedge to help me, wait for whatever that missing ingredient is so I can go to the front. So uh, if you see me leading the race early on, you can say they got her dialed in. If you see me struggling a little bit, you can say watch them because they're gonna be working on the car. And that's, that's what we do. I'll come in, Junior will put three rounds of bite in it or we'll change the tire stagger or we may work on the car all day long until we finally get it the way I want. Well, we've seen both instances already in this race. He has led and now appears to be struggling somewhat, running in seventh position, but certainly not letting the leaders get too far ahead. Buddy Baker in car number 88 is in. We hood up on the car. Let's get more information on that. Here's Jack Aroot. Buddy, what finally put you out of the race? Uh, something was wrong with the braking system. I don't know exactly what it was, but the brakes were applied all the time. When I backed off on the straightaway, it looked like I had my foot on the brake, and uh, they caught on fire in the whole bit. So I don't think we're going back out again. We've talked early on that weather's going to be a key factor here today. Do you think that the temperatures will dictate anything? No, it's real nice out there. I thought it was going to be hot, but it's not hot. That's the story. Well, he's finished fourth twice this year in the Daytona 500 and in the Bristol 500. However, the afternoon appears to be over for Buddy Baker from Charlotte, North Carolina. Well, you know, one of the tricks here is to do as well during the race as qualifying as we go back inside of Kyle Petty's car and look at Terry Labonte filling up, I guess, Kyle's rearview mirror and certainly our lens on our in-car camera. I was about to comment on Bobby Allison. They thought they could run as fast all day during the race as they qualified, and so far, I guess they're doing it. But here's Labonte kind of turning the tables on Kyle Petty. Remember a few laps ago when Petty was really turning the wick up on Labonte? Well, now it's the other way around. Keep in mind, we're well up near the front of the pack. These two cars have run high into the top five all race long. For Terry Labonte, I guess you'd say that's routine. For Kyle Petty, maybe that's something that's going to become routine in the near future. There are many people who believe that this is certainly one of the finest teams in the history of Grand National Racing. A lot of people were saying it was only a matter of time before Kyle Petty really started to run competitively near the front, and today he is certainly doing it. That car is performing quite well. And a couple of very good drivers are battling out there on the racetrack. Jeff Bodine in car number five and Ricky Rudd, car number 15. Well, Bob, I've been watching Ricky, and he has been racing with a lot of people today and running both the low as well as the middle groove. That car seems to be running quite well. Bodine has been relatively quiet today, but running fast. Rudd did very well in the race at Bristol and battled with Dale Earnhardt right down to almost the uh, final checkered flag. But there are those that say that the reason why he didn't win that race was a decision he made on tires. And we ask him about that. After Bristol, you were pretty hard on yourself. You said, I made the decision to come in for the tires and I chose the wrong side. Last year at this race, tires really determined who was going to win the race. Let me ask you, Ricky Rudd, who's going to make those decisions at North Wilkesboro this time? Well, Bud made decisions last year, but it really, at that time, we changed four tires, which that, the rule was different. We did everything we were supposed to do. We changed four tires like you should have done. Uh, the trouble that we had, and, and really in practice, we have to debate whether or not we're going to set our car up to run a long time on hot tires, or we're going to set it up to run short little sprint races along the way. And you really have to make a choice. You can set the car to go short distances and be a little bit faster. But if you get on a long run where you're stuck about 200 laps on a set of tires, you can find yourself getting lapped. So it really is critical. Those decisions are really made during the week. And uh, we usually choose to make the car run as long as we can on a set of tires, especially with the new tire rule. 
and at Bristol the other week, it was working for us. Everything was going great. The only thing that we didn't count on was that caution right at the end of the race. Uh, whether or not we changed left sides or right sides, I really don't think it was really as critical as maybe as it looked like. Uh, we, we lost the race, but I'm not so sure it wasn't the tire change as much as it was the way we had our car adjusted. Ricky Rudd in the Bud Moore prepared Motorcraft Camelot Ford. He's 11th in the Winston Cup point standings going into this race. His uh, finish last year here in this race was third, and he was sixth in the fall race here at North Wilkesboro last year. Bobby Allison continues to lead, and Bobby Hillen is in uh, for a stop. He was black flag, and our indications are that the rear end might be going out of that car. Well, Jake Elder, Jake Suitcase Elder, left this team this week. And talking with Bobby earlier this weekend, he said that, well, it was Jake's decision. Ron Purier, who primarily works on the engines, is serving as crew chief. Down here in Bobby Hillen's pit, one crew member is directly behind the rear axle. He's checking the rear end over, and they're looking to see the condition and see if they can follow where the grease is coming from. They've got the car up on the jack. Bobby Hillen remains in the car. Now they've rolled out from underneath it. They're going to drop the jack and send him back in. Bobby Hillen moving back out onto the racetrack to resume his competition in the Northwestern Bank 400, where Bobby Allison is leading right now with Kyle Petty running second, then Terry Labonte, Jeff Bodine is fourth, and Ricky Rudd is in fifth. 11th place is Darrell Waltrip. Sixth place is Darrell Waltrip. In seventh position is Dale Earnhardt. Eighth is Harry Gant. Ninth is Ron Bouchard. And 10th is Bill Elliott. There's the leader, Bobby Allison. Now remember, Allison is one of only those four people who have ever won races here at North Wilkesboro who are in today's starting field. Of course, Richard Petty and Darrell Waltrip are two of the other four. This guy, Bobby Allison, is a third. And Tim Richmond, who has only won one time, that was that relatively, uh, I guess you'd call it a surprise victory in this race last year. But I think Bobby Allison is really demonstrating as to how much experience really means here at North Wilkesboro. Allison passing Buddy Arrington in the Ford. A lot of track improvements have been made here since we visited last at North Wilkesboro, North Carolina Speedway. And along with that, NASCAR and ESPN present a track fact. Here's a visit with an old friend here in North Wilkesboro, somebody by the name of Ray Call back in 1977 christened it. But it's been around a long time, this heavy equipment tire here at the bottom of turn number four. Through the years, it has received and absorbed a lot of impacts from drivers. It used to protect them from a corrugated steel wall on the bottom of this turn, but now the crews here at North Wilkesboro have replaced it with the more predictable and dependable hard concrete. Track backs are back at the Northwestern Bank 400. 92 laps have been completed. We're nearing the one quarter mark of this 400 lap race with Bobby Allison from Hueytown, Alabama, leading the race. And ever since being champ of the Winston Cup division back in 1973, well, he hasn't tasted uh, particularly good success. Jack Aroot, is there a new optimism down there in the Bobby Allison pit because of his uh, performance so far today? Well, Bob, remember one thing. Bobby Allison is one of the few drivers that revels in the heat. Cold is what bothers Bobby Allison as a driver. So from an athletic standpoint, Bobby's quite happy with the weather. The crew, there is some optimism there. They tend to think that maybe they've gone the right direction. The thing to remember, however, is the fact that temperature, as we've talked so much, could have an effect upon tires. Now, what we've done, Bob, is we've made a quick polling with some crew chiefs, and the first set of tires that came off during that caution period on some of the teams were running temperature-wise at about 270 degrees. Now, normally, they should run about 240 degrees. So I asked them what that meant, and they said it means that the track is loosening up. It's getting slick. So what we'll probably see in the next round of pit stops are some rounds of bite, as they call it, going into the rears of the car where they jack the weight to the back. We will watch for that next time we have a series of pit stops on the racetrack. Jeff Bonai, Neil Bonnet, and also Daryl Waltrip are out there battling for position. This is fourth, fifth, and sixth. And apparently that problem that Neil Bonnet had after the yellow flag came out uh, has all been corrected. Neil Bonnet is uh, in sixth spot. Yeah, he really is. He goes to the inside of Jeff Bodine. Remember, Bob, that the longer this race runs under a green flag, if Neil Bonnet has an overheating problem, that works to that team's advantage. But Neil has really recovered nicely because 
he not only lost a lot of ground on the racetrack because of what we thought to be a vapor lock earlier in the race, but he had that near collision with teammate Darrell Waltrip during that set of pit stops that followed the yellow flag therein. But uh, Neil is really coming on now, and he seems to be running almost as quick, maybe quicker, than his teammate uh, Darrell Waltrip. Jack, what's the prevailing thought down there? Well, Larry, what they at first thought was an overheating problem indeed is a vapor lock problem. And as it was explained to me by Tim Brewer, the team manager, is all of the heat building up inside the cowling of the car is running right against all of the fuel lines. They're not insulated, and that's beginning, especially under extended caution periods, to increase the heat of the fuel. And that's the problem, not overheating in terms of Waltrip water temperature. Waltrip is in trouble, Waltrip in trouble, slowing dramatically in turn three. The car just seemed to quit running on him. And he's very smoke. slow, and smoke is coming out of the cockpit. Bob, it's not really coming out of the exhaust, I don't believe, so it doesn't appear to be necessarily a blowing engine because the smoke is pouring right back inside the cockpit. He lost power almost immediately. The car slowed down significantly. We will not go under yellow because I don't see any type of liquid or precipitation falling out of the car of the racetrack, but this is costing Daryl dearly. And no. he stays out, Bob. Yeah, and he was running in heavy traffic when that occurred, too, and all of a sudden the car just seemed to die. A car quit running very sharply and it took a lot of good driving with the drivers behind him to avoid running into him. Darrell Walter is staying out there. We'll see if he can get that car back up to speed and into competition. But for right now, things are not looking good for Darrell Walter. Eight wins here at North Wilkesboro. Well, Bob, one of the theories up here is power steering pump. You know, it's right underneath the, which you might call the dashboard, right underneath the, the windshield on the car. It obviously operates hydraulically. There is fluid in there. And with the smoke coming from right underneath the back part of the hood, there is a possibility that the power steering pump might have gone out. Now, we've seen already this year on ESPN broadcast that one driver can certainly muscle this car the entirety of the race without power steering. If that indeed was the only problem, once it's, it solves itself, the smoke going away, Darrell can work immediately back up to speed. We talked about the frustrations that Bobby Allison has had since being the champion of the Winston Cup division in 1983. Here's Jack Aroot to talk with him. Racing for the Miller team this year has been really a, a fluctuation type deal. It's been a good day and then a bad day and then vice versa back and forth. Has it been frustrating to the entire team, not just to Bobby Allison? Well, I'd say that uh, we've had one of those uh, seasons so far that uh, really leaves us uh, scratching our head wondering uh, we've run so good on several occasions and, and we've had problems but uh, we have to keep working and uh, just just keep on and I've been through it before and, and everyone on the crew has been through it before and uh, we know that this is part of racing uh, we, we hate to accept it but it's a fact and so we just uh, continue to, to do our best job and hope we work our way out of the hole. Right now, Bobby Allison on the point as he is the leader. New third place is Neil Bonnet in car 12. Terry Labonte slips back to fourth spot, still running in second with an outstanding performance in the first quarter of this race. Kyle Petty, there's a look at Neil Bonnet. Well, Bob Neal told me earlier this week, if I can just keep from crashing, I'm going to be, well, heck on wheels. He says, it seems to me like I either win or run up front or crash. But today, Neil certainly has not crashed. And boy, has that car been performing the last 20 or 30 green flag laps. More than a fourth of the way through this race, and the average speed is 91.575 miles an hour. We've had three leaders in this race. Darrell Waltrip led through lap 54. Then Ken Schrader led for four laps, and Bobby Allison has taken over the lead. He took over the lead on lap number 59 and has led ever since. Two yellows, one because of an accident involving Eddie Bershwell and a mechanical problem involving Buddy Baker. We'll be right back with more live coverage from North Wilkesboro. There he is. Neil Bonnet running right ahead of Kyle Petty, and so now Kyle is in third spot. And he may be in third spot, but you know, Bob, there is something to be said about race pace, about running as fast as you want to do, particularly in the early stages, first half of a race. Remember, we're going to go 400 laps here. We haven't even got to the halfway point yet. 
and Kyle Petty could be one of those people running exactly the way he wants to run. There you see him swinging the car up wider, actually leaving the car slide up high as they're trying to work their way through some of the people they're lapping. Following Neil Bonham through, they dive down low going into turn number three. Kyle taking that middle lane. There's Bobby Hill on his left. Bobby's had his problems today. He's not running nearly as fast as he would like to, but at least he's still out there. Moving up to J.D. McDuffie. You can see Kyle moving right up on J.D. There is the ultimate in trust. I'll tell you, a couple of real professional race drivers racing at better than 100 miles an hour within just, well, slight inches of each other. Unbelievable shots from Kyle Petty's car on the North Wilkesboro Speedway. Bob, the other thing that it shows is that just how close to being out of control a professional race driver really is all the time. It's not an optical illusion to see the car almost swishing back and forth. It's warm out there. As Buddy Baker said, it's not nearly as bad as they all kind of anticipated, but when you're going at these speeds on a smooth, paved, half-mile racetrack, or certainly any track larger, the car doesn't really steer. You kind of point it. You have to anticipate every 50, 100, 200 feet in front of you. So that slight moving back and forth that almost seems like an airplane flying, that's probably much more close to the sensation that you have when you're racing than when you're on the streetcar because you can feel every little movement of the steering wheel. Now Dave Marcus moving high on the straightaway and as you can see him point to the inside and say, Kyle, you go right ahead. This will be an opportunity for me to get myself on the air, perhaps. <laughs> Dave Marcus being lapped. He is uh, in 16th position right now. Kyle Petty sending the car back down into the corner. Well, Bob, you can also see that Kyle didn't really struggle to get by Dave, but it didn't happen with rapid fire succession. And there again, we're getting back to this tire situation in this racetrack. Keep in mind, it's very dynamic. It can change rapidly, and one pit stop can completely change the complexion of your race car. Bobby Allison moves off of corner number four. We're going to see the difference in lap times between Bobby Allison. We've got the clock started on him. We'll time this lap. And then next time around, we'll time Neil Bonnet to see if Bonnet is indeed faster than Bobby Allison. Now, there is Tim Richmond, who is going down a lap. Remember, Tim spun early in the race on uh, lap uh, number 15, I believe, and brought out a caution period. And at that time, almost lost a lap, but has now gone one that lap down to the leader officially. 22.1 seconds is the time for Bobby Allison. That is 101.809. Pair that with a qualifying speed of 111 miles an hour. So they're actually running about 10 miles an hour slower in race traffic than they qualify. Now, here comes Neil Bonnet. He crosses the start-finish line and clicks off our electric timer and we'll see how his time compares with Bobby Allison's 22.1 seconds was Allison's now Neil Bonnet is negotiating turns number three and four out of four onto the main straightaway and the clock stops at 21.7 so he is running a faster lap time than Bobby Allison I would suggest that both of them, however, are probably running just about where they would like to be at this stage of the race. Actually, many of the crews felt that because of the heat conditions on the racetrack, the actual race speed and time would end up being slower than what it is right now. So even though Neil is moving up, I remind you, once again, we have a long, long ways to go. So Bobby Allison and Neil Bonnet, cars number 22 and 12, teacher and former protege, running 1-2, they're probably in a position where a lot of smiles going on right now, not only in the cockpit, but also down in the pit area. Judy Allison is watching from the pit area. Her husband, Bobby, leading the race. There's a little bit of a grin there, don't you think? Well, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Keeping the lap charts and making sure at least she is aware of where her husband is at all times on the racetrack. Judy Allison, and there is husband Bobby. Well, here's something that perhaps Jack can come on, comment on a little later. Another thing that I think helps Bobby Allison in a situation like this on a short track, Bob, is that Bobby races so much. He has raced under absolutely every condition conceivable to man. So no matter what the climate presents to Bobby Allison or the racetrack, I've seen races where the racetrack was coming up in giant chunks and crashing through Bobby Allison's windshield. So he can race under almost any condition. Nothing would be a surprise to him. I think that his experience would be a real advantage on a day like today. 
We talked about some of the track improvements that have been made here at North Wilkesboro. There is a shot of the new scoring tower that they have built outside of corner number four. That's where the scorers watch the race from. Larry Duber has more. 5, 10, 20, maybe as many as 30 cars all whizzing by in about a second. You know, it can be as fast as 200 miles an hour on a super speedway. Now, keeping all of those cars in perfect order in terms of on the piece of paper, that may be the biggest job of a sanctioning body. Now, in NASCAR, it's an intricate system actually uniting several techniques. There are scores, two finish lines, a camera, and a professional score auditor. Now, to begin with, each car has two scores. The team provides one, and NASCAR provides another. And each lap is recorded in these little squares in the race's running time. And every 10 laps, the car's number is flashed up to keep an unofficial running order. There are two finish lines in every race, one directly underneath the official scoring stand, which determines the lap leader, unless there is a caution flag. Then the official line is directly under the starter. Also, there are independent scores at the entrance and the exit to pit row. And there is a caution tape person to keep complete track during any yellow flag conditions. When it's all over, the order of finish is determined by how many of those squares you filled in and who was able to do it first. Now, Morris Metcalf, NASCAR's official score, can do all of this in about five minutes. And during the running of the race, he shouts out instructions to all, kind of like a quarterback. If there are any disputes, rechecks can be made and all of these written records used to determine the official order of finish. And of course, there's the old finish line camera. You know, about a decade ago, Bobby Allison and Cale Yarborough both tried to get into victory lane at Nashville. Hopefully, all of this will avoid that sort of thing. But you know, in NASCAR, someday, there's going to be a tie. Well, Larry recorded that feature yesterday during a modified race on this uh, course, and that race was won by Bill Kimmel from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. In the Grand National Race here in North Wilkesboro, the leader is Bobby Allison. We'll be right back. North Carolina Speedway, where the Northwestern Bank 400 is underway with 145 laps completed. And there is the battle for first place. It involves Bobby Allison in car number 22. Running in second position is Neil Bonnet in car number 12. Let's review the top 20 positions for you. Kyle Petty is in third. Jeff Bodine fourth. And Dale Earnhardt is running fifth. In sixth spot is Terry Labonte. Then Ricky Rudd, Harry Gant, Daryl Waltrip, and Bill Elliott. In 11th position, Richard Petty. 12th is Ken Schrader. 13th is Lake Speed. A lap down in 14th, Ron Bouchard. Darrell Waltrip in 15th position. 16th spot belongs to Dave Marcus, then Phil Parsons, Rusty Wallace, Clark Dwyer, and Buddy Arrington. We have had two yellow flags displayed here on the racetrack this afternoon. One because of an accident involving Eddie Birchwell. His car hit the tire down at the end of Pitt Road and his car was knocked out of the race, and then Tim Richmond spun in turn number four, but was able to continue in the race. Only two cars out of the competition, Birchwale and Buddy Baker. And Bob, we're at the point in the race where Allison and number 12, Neil Bonnet, are beginning to work their way into the top 10 as far as putting laps on people. For everybody's information at home, Richard Petty, Ken Schrader, and Lake Speed went a lap down while we were running down the top 20. So you get an idea of just how fast Allison and Bonnet are going. Well, confidence is not a word in the vocabulary of most crew chiefs, especially during the heat of battle. But if you take a look at Leonard Wood, it's very obvious that he's pleased with the run that Kyle Petty has made thus far this afternoon. They're running solidly in the top five, and him sitting up in the truck kind of says it all. Looks like a very relaxed person, but his driver is running very well. That is Kyle Petty, and there is the shot from inside his car. Kyle in third spot. Well, they've won a lot of races, I'll tell you. There you see Phil Parsons motioning to uh, Kyle Petty, telling him, I see you're coming, go to the high side. Not an easy trick on a day like today. As you can see, Kyle fights it just a little bit, but he knows that Phil has already recognized that he's coming around, and he will be getting way on the high side. There goes Kyle Petty around Phil. Both of the Junior Johnson cars have had trouble here today. Neil Bonnet's car failed to go when the green came out from a yellow vapor lock. Apparently, that situation is okay now because Neil is running in second spot. And then Darrell Waltrip slowed dramatically in the third turn during one particular lap. We uh, theorize that the power steering may have gone out on that car. In any case, Darrell is also back up to speed. 
you saw Phil Parsons down on the inside fighting that wheel for a second there. I think he was kind of watching carefully the rearview mirror. There were some faster cars moving by on the high side. There you see Jeff Bodine and Rusty Wallace working to the high side of Phil Parsons. But uh, everything is back in running order for Phil as we watch from inside Kyle Petty's car. Well, Bob and Larry, at first you thought that it was power steering, and in some cases we thought it might be something in the drivetrain. The latest information that we can get from the crew chief is the fact that he's got a problem possibly with the rear end cooling system. We'll just have to wait and see, but they're prepared should he have to come in and add additional rear end grease. Well, he's running in eighth position right now, and on your screen, Darrell Walter from Franklin, Tennessee, an eight-time winner here on this racetrack. Bobby has about a straightaway advantage over first and second place. There's Bonnet continuing to just hound Bobby Allison as they come out of turn number four. Waltrip, whom Jack just talked about, is entering turn number one. Darrell seems to have gotten to a period of the race where he has slowed down again. He is not running at extremely reduced speed, but the leaders are beginning to move up on Darrell, and boy, does he need a caution flag right now. Of course, we all have seen Darrell Waltrip drop more than a lap to the leaders before the halfway point of any 400 lap race, he always seems to have the ability to come back. Just in case you Bill Elliott fans are wondering where your driver is at this particular point, he's running in 10 spot and has not had a particularly good day. We've seen him uh, out of the groove on a couple of occasions, trying very hard on this short track here. He's lying right now in 10th position. Allison, the leader, and Bonnet in second place going inside, and Buddy Arrington in that board moving high on the racetrack to let them go by. An impressive performance so far with 155 laps completed for Bobby Allison. He started this race up front. As a matter of fact, he was the third quickest qualifier after the two days average type of thing and has moved into the lead, went into the lead on lap number 59. Well, unlike Bobby Allison, who is still groping for that first win in a long time, the first win in 1985, Neil Bonnet already does have a win. Here's a guy, Harry Gann, who when he started the race today, he went over the $100,000 winning mark. He finished second at North, he's finished second at North Wilkesboro four times, including last year, uh, once I believe it was, but when he started today and took the green flag, he won over $100,000 already this year in earnings. He became, I believe, something like the ninth driver already this year to win that amount of money. Harry Gant from Taylorsville, North Carolina, which isn't too awfully far from where we are this afternoon here in North Wilkesboro. Started 15th in this race in the Skull Bandit Chevrolet. Harry, of course, is a veteran of the short tracks around this area, and we ask him if uh, that gave him an advantage here. Harry, you have years and years of short track experience. Does it help you when you come to a place like North Wilkesboro? No, I believe it hurts you. <laughs> these, these cars are so much different from what we ran on the short track, so everybody's got the same advantage here, although even someone that has never even run a short track uh, in a sportsman car and just run Grand National is better, I think. These cars are much heavier and everything works different. The longer races, track gets slicker. So I, I can't say this really helped a bit from my experience on short tracks. Well, we have a new leader while we were listening to Harry Gant. Neil Bonnet moved into the lead, and he becomes our fourth leader of the afternoon. Bob, as we look at these two guys, both of whom have run many, many races on short tracks, you know, racing on short tracks in the early stages of your career, it's kind of like going to college. Everybody asks, well, did you go to college? You have to kind of pass that test before you move on. It doesn't necessarily apply to what your job is today. The first word that comes out of everybody's mouth, once you say, yeah, I went to college, they say, well, what kind of experience do you have for this job? And you say, well, this is my first one. So that's kind of how I would equate it. You run all those years on the short tracks, it's like you're paying your dues, but when you come up to the Grand National Racing, there are some skills, of course, that you've learned through all those years of short track racing. But you really have to refine them and hone them and adjust them so that they adapt to these 3,700-pound cars anywhere from 80 miles an hour to over 200 miles an hour on the big tracks. And you can see how Bill Elliott has just been lapped by the leaders as the average speed is 95.001. There's Gant, there's Bonnet, there's Allison, and there is Bill Elliott, who has just been lapped in ninth position. Now, Harry Gant is running in 10th position. Make that uh, 8th position, and Harry is just about to go a lap down to the leaders. 
Bobby Allison, by the way, led 102 laps before Neil Bonnet took over command. He led laps 59 until lap 102. Well, if you're beginning to wonder, oh, gee, are we working on some kind of wreck here because we've gone so far without any caution flags? There's no way. Back in 1971 here, an entire race ran without a caution flag. Bobby Isaac uh, was the winner of that race. Daryl Derringer led most of the most of the laps in the Junior Johnson Ford, but they went the entire distance without any yellow bunting. And there is Ron Bouchard, who has come in for a stop. The hood up on that car while tires are being changed on the right side and fuel is being dumped in. There's Ron Bouchard from Pittsburgh, Massachusetts. Bob, there is some chemical going uh, underneath the hood. Apparently something in there is leaking or maybe overheating. They're trying to work. And lots of smoke coming out from the exhaust headers now. Probably the brakes getting hot in the car as they start to change tires. Remember, green flight conditions, they can change all four here if they want to. They, you also saw a crew member going underneath the hood and doing some twisting action. They're trying to uh, crank a little more weight into that corner of the car to make the car stick a little better in the corners. But I don't believe this is necessarily a routine pit stop. They did a lot of work, Jack. Larry and Bob, the thing to remember when you look at the temperature and possibly the problem with brakes here, temperature-wise, brake calipers will get as hot as 1,500 degrees. Now, what does that really mean? Well, an acetylene cutting torch cuts metal at 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're only dealing with about 300 degrees before we reach the melting point. That is hot. That's uh, even hotter than the people that are uh, sitting out here in front of us in the hot sunshine. You betcha. By the way, as we watch the leaders, Eddie Bershwell, whom we saw crash a little earlier today, is making his way back out onto the racetrack. So for all you fans down there in Texas, Eddie's back. Bershwell moving out onto the racetrack after an incident down in corner number four early on in the race. So Junior Johnson there he is. He sees one of his cars driven by Neil Bonnet in the lead at this point. It has about a three or four car length lead on Bobby Allison running in second position. And it's always nice to come to North Wilkesboro for a race because you know that Junior and Flossie are fixing up some breakfast. Jack Aroot files this report. Just a few miles away from the speedway and well beyond the roar of engines is the pastoral setting that champion car owner Junior Johnson calls home. It's become an annual tradition to stop by Junior's on Saturday morning during race weeks at North Wilkesboro. Fresh country ham, country sausage, and bacon. It's all part of the weekend here at North Wilkesboro for the Northwestern Bank 400. If you're one of the A team or the A group here at North Wilkesboro, you get invited to Junior Johnson's home for breakfast on Saturday morning. Junior, this has become quite a tradition for you and Flossie, hasn't it? That's right, Jackie. We've uh, been doing this for several years and we really enjoy it. But it's a little different than seeing you bent over a, an engine inside one car number 11 or 12. You're, you're quite a cook here. I don't know about being a cook. I'm basically doing what I'm told. So <laughs> a cook kind of does what he's supposed to. So, but I'm doing what Floss tells me to right now. This is home, and this is part of being at home, isn't it? True. We. This is sort of the kind of way we live through the week, and uh, you know, we just enjoy the way we was brought up and the way we live. A regular as Cardinal baseball grading is slaughter. Junior and I have been friends now for about 30 years, and. Uh, I pull for Junior. I don't care who drives. What, whatever driver he is, I pull for him because he runs with Junior. <laughs> the entire feed is prepared and directed by Junior's wife, Flossie. She's renowned throughout the Carolinas as a champion cook. Flossie, this looks like an assembly line here. <laughs> well, it is. It's really a tradition for you here, oh, isn't it, to yeah. open your house to your friends? And... Jack, I'm going to kill you. What are you doing this for? Well, we just wanted to take a look at what it's like to live up in North Carolina in Rhonda. Well, you know how it is. You've been here. <laughs> so we how, really like it. How many people do you feed on Saturday? Between 45 and 50, I suppose. Not really. We don't count. We you just ever, have enough. Do you ever get tired of it? No. Look forward to it. I tell you what, breakfast at Junior and Flossie is quite an experience. They fill you up, but I don't believe I could eat another thing. Jackie, this will hold you. You have a early lunch. Thank you. Baseball, his nickname was Country, and 
obviously it was more than just a nickname. It was a lifestyle. But in the 1985 baseball season, Enos is going to, I guess, realize a lifelong dream of probably every little boy who played baseball down at the park uh, during summer. He's going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame at Cooperstown. He will be inducted with Lou Brock, Hoyt Wilhelm, and Archie Vaughn, of course, who uh, is now deceased. But this event will be broadcast live on ESPN Sunday, July 28th, when country Enos Slaughter, who had a career that spanned over 20 years in the major leagues of baseball, he has a 300 batting average lifetime. And I remember back in 1946 when he scored a very historic run when he went from first to home when he was playing for the Cardinals on a single against the Red Sox in the World Series. Well, that coverage will be live, and we are live this afternoon at North Wilkesboro, North Carolina, for the Northwestern Bank 400. Neil Bonnet is the leader, Bobby Allison running second. Back with more after these messages. Inside the racetrack, he was sitting sideways, and there was so much traffic still on the racetrack, he was trying to get going again, but just couldn't. There is Dale Earnhardt moving underneath Kyle Petty. This is what happened just a few moments ago down the back stretch as they begin to enter turn number three. Now there's a little jiggle right there. You don't know if the two cars are running together or not. Chances are they will be, but there goes Kyle. Of course, from that angle, you can't tell exactly what happened, who had to land on the racetrack. But you see the wall coming up, and Kyle probably putting on the brakes hard and avoiding really a hard collision with the wall. And now he's pinned there. There must be close to 25 cars still on the racetrack. He just can't move. He's stuck there. You can see all the traffic coming at him. He doesn't go, know to go down, know to go, know to go up. All these cars coming at him, that's not got to be a very comforting sight. I would think not. You got uh, four or five race cars coming at you at uh, 100 miles an hour, and you can't do anything except sit there and hope that they all miss you. They all did. Petty has made a pit stop, and now is going back out there on the track. Some exciting footage once again. And there you can see he almost runs over the... Uh, the pit man who tells the cars to stop or go. There's a lot of confusion down there at the end of pit road, and Kyle Petty is still stalled there. Well, that was a little precarious there for a moment. There are a lot of other cars involved. You saw the man with the stop and go sign anymore running backwards. That was very, very close. Kyle now back out on the racetrack. Of course, we under yellow flag condition, so he's trying to move up to his place in line. Now, he was lapped while he was pinned up there against the wall between three and four. So he will be able to move down to the inside of the racetrack. There you see Kyle and Dale coming together. And it looks like that Kyle was perhaps a little bit unhappy with uh, Dale Earnhardt as he angled his car in as Dale was leaving the pit road. No way to tell exactly what was on whose mind, but that was a close call for everybody involved. Well, it certainly was, as we're still in Kyle Petty's car now. The field is slowed. Well, remember that uh, Dale was located uh, very close to Kyle on the racetrack uh, when the incident occurred, and you saw Kyle uh, giving an indication of his yes. personal feelings to Dale as the two of them moved back out onto the racetrack under yellow flag conditions. I don't think it was an indication that he thought that Dale was number one. No, he just used uh, one or two fingers, though, so no big deal. Petty comes back in now and makes the stop. Well, I'll tell you, it could have been a most significant moment for Kyle Bob because he, without a doubt, was in his best position to win a race this year, and now he really has to scramble to dig out of this hole. As we mentioned, Bobby Allison and Neil Bonnet running second and first in reverse order were able to get around him as he was sitting there in turn number three and four. So Kyle has to move to the inside of the racetrack, hope that he has the right set of tires on right now so that he is running faster than the leaders then continue to run out in front of them until another caution flag flies. And traditionally, on this racetrack, the caution flags are few and far between. Still under yellow because of the Kyle Petty incident. As far as laps are concerned, we have completed 194. We are very near the halfway mark of this Northwestern Bank 400. So far, it's been a relatively accident-free race, just Birch wheels, Incident down in turn four at Tim Richmond spin and in the Kyle Penny spin. Those are the only three caution periods that we have had. And so far we have had five lead changes among four drivers. As the number 12 car of Neil Bonnet is shown back in the lead. Well, let's uh, try to establish some radio contact here. 
Kyle, this is Bob Jenkins up in the booth. Uh, what happened up there in turn number three? Kyle down there, then at the end of uh, Pitt Road, there was also some confusion. Were you, you just trying to uh, tell Dale something or make gestures to him? What does it wrong? I just pulled up the side of Earnhardt to let him know I knew that he hit me, and then you better watch it coming up. All right, Kyle, we'll stay out there and hang in there. <laughs> Bob, I'll tell you, I, I, tell you the, I believe that the mark of a professional racing driver is one who is willing to hold his ground in the face of anybody, be it A.J. Foyt or almost anybody on the racetrack. And obviously, Kyle Petty has become of age. If anybody questioned that, I think that moment right there answered any and all questions. Let's go down to Jack Aroot in the pit area. There's been a call put out to Buddy Baker. Car number 88 is out of the race, but the 43 STP Richard Petty crew is asking for Baker to relieve him. Now remember, Baker was a teammate to Richard Petty back in 1972. Baker was on his way in his car to try and make an early exit out of here. They found him. They're going now to put his driver's suit on, and he'll be coming out of the door behind me very shortly and making his way to the STP pits. Jackie, is there a reason why Richard wants to step out of that car? Is he ill or too hot or what? Bob, we just jumped on the story. We tried to get it to you as quick as we could. We're on our way to the STB pit right now, and we'll have that story for you as well. All right. Good work down there, and we'll look forward to uh, finding out exactly what is wrong with Richard Petty, because he's seeking relief from Buddy Baker. Back with more live coverage this afternoon from North Wilkesboro's North Carolina Northwestern Bank 400 in a moment. Interesting situation. Buddy Baker has helmet on now and is ready to step into that STP Pontiac when Richard Petty brings it in. We are halfway through the Northwestern Bank 400. And this is held by Neil Bonnet. In second position is Bobby Allison. Third, Jeff Bodine. Ricky Rudd is fourth. Terry Labonte, fifth. Earnhardt is running sixth, and Darrell Waltrip is seventh. Those seven cars are on the lead lap. A lap down in eighth position is Bill Elliott. In ninth is Richard Petty, and tenth place is Lake Speed. You know, Bob, the past couple of seasons have been earmarked by really excellent competition as far as the NASCAR division goes. We've had a multiple winners, even by, oh, the third mark of the season, we've had anywhere from seven to eight different winners. But in this season, only three cars have visited victory lane in three, or rather in six races. Bill Elliott, of course, has won three in the super speedways. Dale Earnhardt has won two, and Neil Bonnet already is a winner this year. And right now, Bonnet looks like he obviously is in the best seat to bring home the bacon here. It's kind of interesting that the wins seem to be among three or four drivers. Of course, there are a couple who have been close on a number of occasions, but yet are able to sneak into victory lane. But the competition seems to be boiling down in 1985. Neil Bonnet formed in the standings in the Winston Cup battle for supremacy in Winston Cup racing. Off of corner number four is Neil Bonnet in the Chevrolet. And as far as uh, boards are concerned, you got to look back to fourth position where Ricky Rudd is uh, in the boards. So we, we've been talking about uh, all race long, the fact that three Chevys have won this year, that three boards have, won, what, boards have won three times this year. And this is the seventh and deciding game, so to speak, in the World Series. Yeah. Who will win this one? That's a good way of putting it. You know, the, the guys who are interesting to watch in this race as we continue to monitor the leader's progress, or rather second place progress, Bobby Allison, are Bodine, who runs in third, Ricky Rudd is running in fourth, and Terry Labonte fifth. You know, they, they have been running with themselves. They haven't really raced anybody else hard all day long, but they're right there in the top five. And those three cars are really in the position, I think, that is a nice place to be at this stage of the racetrack, at this stage of the race. They would probably like to be closer to Bonnet, but we're still well over 150 laps yet to go. Remember Bodon, he's very good on these short tracks. He won three times last year. Ricky Rudd, who performed so well here last year, and Terry Labonte, I tell you, he and Dale Inman, they are absolutely astounding. They have the ability to run in the top five, I think, with more consistency than anybody else, at least the last couple of seasons. Neil Bonnet was ninth in this race last year. He finished fourth in the Holly Forms 400, which is the fall race held here at North Wilkesboro Speedway. Bonnet from Hueytown, Alabama. And the 
interval there you can see is uh, several car lengths, about a half a straightaway, I would say. The advantage that Neil Bonnet enjoys over Bobby Allison. Neil has been leading since lap number 100. And 91. He took over the lead for the second time on lap 191, and now we are well past the halfway point. Well, Bob, a little while ago I said when Kyle was sitting there between three and four, there must have been 25 cars left on the racetrack. Maybe one of the reasons why he had such a hard time getting back into the groove is that he's just been handed a note that we have only one car that is officially out of this race, and that is the number 88 of Buddy Baker. Eddie Birchwall was involved in that significant caution flag a little earlier. He has been back out, but only Buddy Baker's car is scored as officially out of this race. And I'll tell you, that's quite a tribute to the preparation that all the crews do for these cars. Birchwall's car, though, is in the pit area and is uh, not on the racetrack at the moment. There is an ambulance that is standing by in case any driver should be injured in this race here this afternoon. There's been quite a bit of controversy regarding the length of time it takes for safety crews to get to the scene of an accident. We talked to Neil Bonnet about that. Well, you've been able to go look at other professional sports through the years. If, if you could write the rule or make an assist on the medical side, what would you suggest that they do? Well, I've talked to a lot of the other drivers lately, and they've come up to me and Buddy Baker after last week and some different deals. We just discussed it. And I I, I guarantee you, drivers meeting, if we said, look, drivers, uh, we might have to run extra, two or three extra caution laps. It might require three or four laps out of a 500-mile race, like at Bristol, 500 laps. I'm sure that other two or three laps on the caution is not going to be a factor on the outcome of that race, but it might be a factor on somebody's safety or the health of one of our drivers, and I don't think that should even enter into the picture. I feel like as soon as something happens, send somebody out there and have a timeout or whatever we got to do, but we need to look after these drivers. On his criticism initially came after an incident at Bristol, and then, of course, last week, Buddy Baker says he was knocked unconscious for a couple of minutes and uh, woke up, and there was still nobody there to his assistance. But there is Buddy now, wide awake and ready to step into the Richard Petty car when Petty makes a pit stop. Bob, there was a meeting this morning, as there is every race morning, with NASCAR officials and the safety crews who have been hired on here this weekend at North Wilkesboro. And NASCAR did emphasize to the safety crews that they want them to respond to every incident on the racetrack. So they are attempting to make steps to correct whatever unhappiness some of the competitors have. Bonnet just continues to act like he's on a rail out there that car performing very well and he has opened up uh, just a little more than a half a straightaway lead now on Bobby Allison in third position right behind Bobby Allison as a matter of fact making it a good race for second spot is Jeff Bodine in that car number five who had a very poor first qualifying day but then came back and qualified well yesterday in the second uh, day of qualifying that put him in the ninth starting spot. There's Bobby Allison in car number 22. Right behind him, the yellow car, is Jeff Bodine. And there is the leader. There's a good indication of the interval between first and second position. Bob pit stop should be coming up very shortly. The last time we pitted was, I believe, around lap 55. And uh, there was a yellow flag in there, but not uh, everybody did all the work they wanted to complete. Normally run about 160 laps, 165 laps here at North Wilk. So it's possible that within the next 10 minutes here, everybody should be uh, ready to come in and take another goal. Well, one guy that has been in for a couple of pit stops in the last 10 or 15 laps, Harry Gant. They have uh, done some work on that car, changed some tires, and uh, also done some uh, adjusting the uh, weight of the car. Harry Gant is. Uh, down a couple of laps to the field, but is still out there in competition. Yeah, Bob, I do stand corrected. I forgot about the uh, yellow flag that was in the late 100s here. Everybody did come in around lap 190, so we do have significant distance to go yet. And that really plays to the advantage of Bonnet and Bobby Allison. Now, Bodine has moved up. He begins to challenge Bobby Allison. Ricky Rudd is still in it, as is Labonte, but the two leaders are running very smoothly. Well, one thing we like to do at our Grand National Races is have a question of the week. And uh, we try to come up with some interesting little tidbits as far as what we like to ask these uh, drivers. And we think you'll find the answer of the, the question of the week very interesting this week. I had a, an aunt that had a niece that, that had a, a cousin who bought a dog that came from Alabama once. 
That is not Jimmy Stewart. And the top five with 225 laps completed. Neil Bonnet, the leader. Bobby Allison, second. Jeff Bodine, third. Ricky Rudd, fourth. Terry Labonte running in fifth position. There is the leader, Neil Bonnet, in the Budweiser Chevrolet. As we watch, watch Neil, go back to the fact that we started, of course, 30 cars in today's race. The people who were here who did not qualify, it was a, a very competitive field, although there was not an excessive number of entries. Ed Borges almost got into this field, as did Tommy Grote Crozier. And Maurice Randa, who hauls all the way down from Charlotte, Michigan, was here as an entry this week, was able to get out of the track and practice, but was unable to qualify into today's field. But that guy, Neil Bonnet, not only qualified into the field, but he has performed admirably during the running of this race. You know, he started, Bob, this race in fifth position, and that's another tradition here at North Wilkesboro. Uh, the guys who start particularly in the first couple of rows seem to do very, very well here. Now, Neil starting in fifth, of course, is in row number three, so he's not exactly in the first four positions. But from the fifth position, six drivers have won the race here. But just to give you an idea how successful the front row has been, 21 times out of 48 races, almost half, the winner has come from the front row. So Neil is breaking a little bit of tradition, but holding up the idea that uh, you have to start up front to do well here at North Wilkes. Well, that excellent impression of Jimmy Stewart there by Bobby Allison was kind of an indication of what the uh, question of the week was going to be. So without further ado, we have uh, several drivers answering our question of the week. Here's Jackie Arruda. Our question of the week for Bill Elliott. If Hollywood called you and said, we're going to make the Bill Elliott story and you get to choose who's going to play the leading lady and who's going to play the leading man, literally playing Bill Elliott, who would they be? Which actress? Well, I'd have to say Morgan Fairchild for the leading lady and, and I'd have to play the leading man. There ain't no doubt about it. Well, I'd want Magnum to play uh, Richard Petty because he seems to be the one that's turning everything on right now. And uh, the girl wise, uh, I guess it'd be up to him, whichever one needed, because uh, Linda wouldn't let me get close to the leading lady anyway, so it wouldn't make a whole lot of difference to me. <laughs> well, let me tell you who the leading lady would be first. Uh, Jacqueline Smith would definitely be the leading lady, and I wouldn't let anybody have that role except me. I'd have to be there. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, nobody else may think so, but uh, I think that Stevie and I could play those roles very well, and we could just live out our, our life as it has been laid down behind us, and it would be a hit. I believe we both would get Academy Awards for it. I think that uh, what, we've, uh, what we've done and uh, the, the things that we've accomplished and the trials and tribulations that we've had would uh, parallel the Loretta Lynn story or maybe even Stroker Ace. Well, I think uh, I like, you know, I've always, always liked Clint Eastwood and uh, uh, Paul Newman always does a good job too. So either one of those guys probably could do the job. Um, I've always liked Rachel Ward or uh, Jacqueline Bissett, either one. Well, I think that probably, without a doubt, we'd have to get Jimmy Stewart to play the leading role. And uh, if they wouldn't let Judy play her own part, uh, maybe we'd get June Allison to do that. Well, I think Bobby's impression of Jimmy Stewart sounded more like an impression of Rich Little doing an impression of somebody else <laughs> doing an impression of Jimmy Stewart. You know, Bob, that was an interesting piece because I got to tell you, you know, when we first talked about the idea of doing that, I wasn't real enthralled by it, but it was very predictable. When you think about Dale Earnhardt talking about Clint Eastwood, it really matches. Bobby Allison talking about Jimmy Stewart. It was a very predictable piece, and I think we see a lot of insight into the personalities of everybody involved. Who would you like to have uh, play your leading role in your biography, Larry? Oh, my goodness. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Really? <laughs> I think I'd go for Dom DeLuise. <laughs> Neil Bonnet is the Meanwhile, leader. back to the race. Yes, yes. <laughs> the uh, Northwestern Bank 400. Seven cars are on the lead lap now, running in 11th position. that the frustrating thing for the Woods brothers and Kyle happens to be that they cannot run faster and run down the leaders because 
they did lose two laps in that spin there between three and four, and they would have hoped that they were so fast in the early stages of this race that they could race back up, get their laps back, and maybe be a threat for victory. But with the laps just continuing to roll by, 220, 225, 230, and Kyle being two laps to go, this set of tires is not propelling him to the front. I would imagine there's a little disappointment in that camp because they look like they really had a chance for victory here all week long, and particularly in the early stages of this race. An unbelievably safe race here. We have only had three caution periods for a total of 19 laps. A couple of spins and Eddie Mearswell's incident with the tire down uh, protecting the end of pit wall. But other than that, the race has been accident-free as we watch Terry Labonte and Dale Earnhardt running in fifth and sixth position. We've talked all race long about how difficult this racetrack is, and we ask Dale Earnhardt about approaching slower traffic. Well, hopefully they don't move out of the way, but sometimes they don't, and uh, you have to nudge them a little, and, uh, you know, if they just continue to stay out in the way, and... Uh, you know, you're you're racing here, you're trying to beat other race cars, and you run up on a guy and he thinks, well, it'll take me, you know, I can go through this, I can go make this lap and then move over. It's really not that kind of situation. Uh, if they were excited about where they were running as we were, uh, you know, they'd get on out of the way and let us go. Uh, the leaders are out there racing for everything they can get, and it, it makes a difference at a place like this if you can get that track position. and. The caution comes out, and you get to the pits for the other guy and get out, and you still got track position, and that's what it's all about. Every little bit hurt, helps and hurts. So, uh, you know, you just try to get around them the best you can, and if you got a guy that give, keeps giving you problems all day, sometimes you give him a little nudge and let you know, let him know that, uh, you know, you're really upset with him. And we have seen lots of nudging here this afternoon so far in the first half of this race. There, once again, the leader, Neil Bonnet with now just about a full straightaway length advantage on Bobby Allison running in second. Jeff Bodine is running in third spot, followed by Ricky Rudd and Terry Labonte. Six through 10 with 245 laps. Gone, Earnhardt, Waltrip, Elliott, Speed, and Petty. We'll be right back. Come out. Buddy, it looks like you're waiting for the bus. Richard Petty's car and the seat in it's about as wide as uh, half of my back. I'm a little bit concerned. I wish that uh, somebody's going to fall out that's a little bit smaller that hurry up before Richard needs help. He's uh, getting a little bit hot. But uh, with my luck, I'll get to run about half of the race for it. Well, it's kind of unfortunate that Buddy Baker's such a big guy because Richard Petty's a lot smaller around the waist than Buddy. Well, you know, when we first heard that uh, Buddy might step into that car. Our immediate thought was the size of the two drivers, and they're about the same height, but Buddy is quite a bit uh, wider, shall we say, than Richard Petty. Yeah, Bobby is, but for a big guy, he's been called the gentle giant. There is no question about the physical conditioning. It's not an overweight situation. He is just a very large man. He's been driving race cars for a long time, and he's kept himself in very good shape for his size. To get a little bit overweight. Buddy has never had that problem, so it's not a matter of uh, excess weight. It's just that Buddy is built, built bigger than Richard Petty. And Sanger, one of the rookies in this race in car number double zero, is not being shown in the top 20. There he is running slow on the racetrack. Now, we can give you, we gave you just a few minutes ago the top 10. We can go through 19 for those of you who are uh, keeping uh, your watch on a particular driver. Kyle Petty is 11th, Tim Richmond 12th, 13th is Dave Marcus, 14th is Harry Gant, those cars are, uh, two laps down. Four laps down in 15th position is Ken Schrader. Then we have Phil Parsons, followed by Rusty Wallace, then Clark Dwyer, Ron Bouchard, and the number 67 of Buddy Arrington. Those uh, two cars are five laps down. Now you see Dale Earnhardt, Daryl Waltrip, and Lake Speed. Lake looks like he's running just as fast, if not a little faster, than the other guys. Now, he has been lapped. Lake has lost at least one lap. Uh, yeah, he's in ninth position, one lap down. But again, that situation with the tires here at North Wilkesboro. There's Daryl Waltrip. Whatever his problems were a little earlier, he certainly has cured them as he goes to the high side of Dale Earnhardt, and he moves up a position. They are battling for sixth position on the racetrack. 
This kind of racetrack, Bob and Jack, it, it's really conducive, I think, to the driving styles of a Dale Earnhardt or a Richard Petty, maybe even a Jeff Bodine. Some of the guys in the crews were telling me this week that, you know, those are three drivers who just bear wrestle with you every lap out there. And when you're in a bull ring like this, close confinement, it probably works to their advantage just a little bit. Maybe there's a little bit of an intimidation factor, but of course the other drivers, the professionals as they are, as you saw with Kyle Petty, they normally respond pretty well. But in the case of Earnhardt, Richmond, and Bodine, I don't know, they're really strong on a track like this when it comes to rubbing door handles. Look at how high Richard uh, Petty is driving on the racetrack, using that upper groove in the corners. See how much higher he is than just about everybody else. Well, here is a breakdown of the career wins at the North Wilkesboro Speedway. Richard Petty has 15 wins here. Darrell Waltrip with eight. Gail Yarborough with five. And Bobby Allison with four. As far as car owners are concerned, Petty Engineering has 15. Junior Johnson, if he can bring home either Bonnet or Waltrip to Victory Lane this afternoon, would tie Petty Engineering for the most wins. Hallman Moody have three, and then there are four owners tied with two wins apiece. You know, Bob, that statistic, actually, both of them, they, they truly do astound me because this racetrack has been around a long time. It started out as a dirt racetrack, then they paved the racetrack in the 50s, and you would think that the longevity of this racetrack plus the change in surface would have been conducive to a lot of different teams winning. But the good old boys of NASCAR, the people who started really the sport back in the 1950s, are the people who have dominated here at North Wilkesboro. And it is amazing how Victory Lane here has been the private property of about three or four families. And as we said at the top of the show, experience at North Wilkesboro, for whatever the reasons are, really is paramount. Dale Earnhardt running in seventh position. Matter of fact, this uh, track was opened back in 1948 as a dirt track, and 10 years later in 1958, it was paved. Of course, the unique thing about this racetrack that we talked about before, you are going downhill as you head turn toward, uh, toward turn number one and going uphill as you go down the back stretch. Well, remember the last time we saw the Grand National Division, Buddy Arrington had made the big switch from Chrysler to Ford, and there is Buddy right now getting a lap put on him by Ricky Rudd. Also recall that Buddy was having a little bit of difficulty working with the power steering. Well, he told me this week that the power steering, he's got it solved, and he's happy with it, and he's on the racetrack, and he feels as though he's running, well, about as good as he really wanted to do at this stage of the game. His fan club, you know, I also have been told this week they have stuck with him. They, they thought in the beginning that maybe it was a bunch of people who were sympathetic to the Chrysler Motor Corporation cause, but when Buddy made the decision to make the change, the fan club has stayed with him. So the fan club is still in place. By the way, Morgan Shepard was with Buddy this week, helping him practice, and Buddy is back on the racetrack and very happy to be uh, Ford. Now he can say he's driven a Ford lately. <laughs> and Buddy is running in 20th position here in the Northwestern Bank 400. The lead is being held by Neil Bonnet. He crosses the line and completes lap number 265. Back with more from North Wilkesboro after this. And Buddy Baker, Richard Petty, and the entire team have been waiting for. The call has gone out, and the SDP number 43 is pulling onto pit road. Now, there's a lot of work that will have to take place under green flag conditions. Petty will have to come out of the car. The belts will have to be adjusted. The radio will have to be re-hooked up to Buddy Baker's helmet. And you can see them trying to lift Richard out of the car now. He gets out in fine fashion, but here's where the work starts. With a sledgehammer, they're going to have to bend open, pry open that seat so a strapping Buddy Baker can replace Richard Petty. Petty is out in a way. He's making his way back for some oxygen. Meanwhile, Baker is trying to pump himself up and get ready for the racing wars. They're adjusting the shoulder harness right now. Baker's bigger in the shoulder area than Petty. They've adjusted the seat belt. They're trying to get everything done with a minimal amount of time. This is precious time, though, because unfortunately it's happened under green flag conditions. Baker is being fitted continuously here. The crew is working now inside the car, trying to clean it out of some of the things that Richard had with him, including some of his rags that he sucks in his mouth during green flight conditions. And they're just moments away from sending Buddy Baker now, instead of Richard Petty, out in old blue. And Bob and Larry, this is, this is what really makes racing 
so incredible when you can make a change like this. Petty, well, you can see, he's just worn out. He's wasted. And that's unfortunate for such an incredible competitor like Richard. But now it's all up to Baker because the car is running so very well and he's losing a lot of laps. This is a tough time for everybody when you've got to come out of a race car because you physically can no longer get the job done. The Quite awesome. Quite honestly, Jackie, I'm surprised we haven't seen more of this because it's got to be incredibly hot down there. Well, the temperatures continue to rise out on the racetrack. And what happens, Bob, is remember that the header pipes travel beneath the floorboards. Now, those header pipes have temperatures as high as 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. That has got to transfer somehow. You know, heat rises, comes up through the cockpit, and it can really raise gain with a driver. They're having a lot of problems getting Baker situated, and it looks as if they're just moments away from sending him off. A lot longer than they had hoped, but he's out in the race right now. Well, it looked like they just about started to pull away with one of the crew members still in the car. But there goes Buddy Baker in the STP Pontiac, and it's been quite a while since I've seen that car driven by someone other than Richard Petty. Yeah, I might point out also, Bob, that uh, it is unusual, despite all of the conditions that Jack outlined, for Richard Petty to need relief in this race. I've got a feeling there's something either happening inside the car that is not conducive to these climactic conditions or something wrong with Richard because he is in pretty good shape for running these races. He has run many of them. Uh, we are not aware of anything specifically wrong with Richard, but it is more than just, I think, the conditions out there because under very normal circumstances, this would have been no problem, I think. Well, I shouldn't say no problem, but there would not have been a problem for Richard going the distance. Bonnet leads. He was in 10th position, Richard Petty was, when he came in, and he lost eight laps while Buddy Baker took over the cockpit. And up to that time, Richard had only lost one lap, so they dropped from 10th probably to about 20th position, but no such problems for Neil Bonnet. He continues to just decimate everybody else out there today with the maybe possible exception of Allison, Jeff Bodine, Ricky Rudd, and Terry Labonte. And now this STP pit stop. Brought to you by STP Corporation. On the Cover and Jack Arood back at North Wilkesboro, North Carolina for the running of the Northwestern Bank 400 7 stop on the Winston Cup Trail for 1985. The leader is Neil Bonnet. Running in second position is Bobby Allison, car number 22, and right behind him in car number 5 is Jeff Bodine. Well, earlier today, we had an exciting race live for you on ESPN from Portugal as Jackie Stewart and John Bisignano bring you, brought you the coverage of the Portuguese Grand Prix. An exciting race it was. You see at the beginning how the Lotuses pulled out with Ayrton Senna showing the way into turn number one and Elaine Prost, who was the winner of the first Formula One race of the year, falling into third position. Unfortunately, there was rain during the entire race. In fact, heavy rain at times. It caused some problems in Boston, Virginia. And Jimmy Hensley won for the second time this year. Tommy Houston, however, continues to lead in points. Continuing to lead the Northwestern Bank 400 is Neil Bonnet from Hueytown, Alabama. We have less than 100 laps to go here. And I'll tell you what, Neil is looking in good shape right now, although Bobby Allison running in second position is not too awfully far behind. Jack Arood is down in the pit area with the uh, crew manager for Bobby Allison, Gary Nelson. Well, well, Gary Nelson, what do you think? Have you got enough to close in on Neil Bonnet? Are you pleased with the setup? Well, we're never really satisfied unless we're leading, but uh, the car's been running good. Right now we're trying to decide what to do. with. Uh, we've got one more stop coming up around 50 laps from the end. It looks like if we change tires, it'll take about 60 laps to make up for the time we lose if the leader doesn't change tires. So uh, we're going to kind of play it by ear. I, I got a feeling we may just put gas in about 40 or 45 laps to go. Was there any strategy to your choice of this pit area? This is a departure from years past. No. Uh, we got kind of, our truck got boxed in and uh, the morning of sign in and he had to wait for all the other trucks to move before he could get in, so this is the best spot we could get, and uh, we're going to do the best we can with what we have. Well, Bob, you can be sure that should they win this race, this will become a permanent spot in North Wilkesboro for Bobby Allison. <laughs> I'll bet that's right. They'll try anything again if they can pull off the victory here, uh, here at North Wilkesboro, and there is the crew watching Bobby Allison uh, in second position. There you can see the position of his pit. It's up toward turn four. Normally, it's down toward turn number one. 
And there is Allison on the racetrack. Well, Bob, of course, the significant strategy in the minds of all crew members, of course, is how fast can you race in and race out in terms of the pit area. That's why all the top teams seem to have a tendency to cluster down in the direction of the, force of the uh, first turn of the pit area. But I'm not so sure at a track like North Wilkesboro here that where the Allison crews are pitted, Maybe that's an advantage. I don't know. There is not too much congestion down there with some of the other front-running teams, at least the teams that run up front on a regular basis. But, by the way, Ricky Rudd has begun, or has pulled to the pit area while we've been talking. But for Allison's pitting, who knows? Get down to the end. If everybody has to stop under green flag, if everybody stops at the same time, maybe that will be an advantage to Bobby. Rudd is shown as fourth place before this pit stop, so this could be the first of a series of pit stops that we'll be seeing in the next few laps. Ricky Rudd back out onto the racetrack, and there is the leader, Neil Bonnet. Still maintaining the lead over Bobby Allison, Jeff Bodine, Terry Labonte, and Dale Earnhardt. Back with more in a moment. Back at North Wilkesboro, North Carolina, Neil Bonnet, the leader. If I said uh, going to our commercial break that he was also fifth, I didn't mean that, of course. I meant that Darrell Waltrip was uh, running at fifth position, and we still have seven cars on the lead lap. You've got to be impressed with the lack of attrition in this race, because as far as we know, we only have two cars that have dropped out of competition. And one of them was caused by an accident up in the fourth corner very early on. That was Eddie Birchwell. And then Buddy Baker dropped out of uh, the race with mechanical problems. Other than that, everybody else is still out there. Bob, if you think back the last couple of years, that's the way it's been here at North Wilkesboro. There is Bobby Gerhardt in the yellow, red, orange, and maroon trim, number 25. It, Frederick Chevrolet machine. Bobby, of course, is from Lebanon, Pennsylvania. That is right in the heart of modified and sprint car country. Bobby, who is another one of the second generation drivers, his father, Bobby Gerhard Sr., won an awful lot of modified races in an old coupe up there in Pennsylvania. Bobby has been trying to emphasize grand national racing the past couple of seasons. He always feels a very sanitary looking machine. You can tell by the paint job of that car. It looks just as good up close as it does from the distance, too. Changed the number this year, maybe to change a little bit of his luck. He seems to get in most of the races he enters, and he was able to qualify here at North Wilkesboro this weekend. One of two dirt trackers, by the way, Ed Sanger from Waterloo, Iowa, the other one, to get into today's race. Well, despite the fact that that car is all nice and clean and shiny, there are a few wheel marks, as you can see there on the left side of the car. But that's a trait of all the race cars that compete on the half mile at North Wilkesboro. We're back inside. Kyle Petty's car as he goes to the outside and passes Bill Parsons going into turn number four or almost passing Bill Parsons. Now as they come onto the straightaway, Kyle does get around him. He's in 10th place, three laps down. Kyle Petty. Bob, a frustrating day. He started the day out as one of the primary aggressors, one of the predators, if you will, in today's race. But because of the way circumstances have unfolded, it's had to become almost passive as far as the other leaders go. As they approach Kyle, Kyle understands where he is positioned in the race. He doesn't really want to damage the chances of somebody else who's in contention, and he's had to kind of lay off, as a matter of fact. So he will be waiting for another week, but Kyle Petty really showed all of us something today. This young man may well be arriving as one of the real front runners in this league. 80 laps to go, and we expect the last series of pit stops and about 50 laps to go. So within the next 30 laps, we will undoubtedly be seeing the final pit stops of the afternoon. There is Dick May in car number 23, who uh, another one of those drivers who shut, uh, showed up here this weekend and just barely made it into the starting lineup. Well, Bob, something interesting about that car, you know, the car was entered this weekend with a fellow by the name of Robbie Robertson from Piedmont, West Virginia, as the listed driver. And the interesting aspect about Robbie's performance this weekend, he attempted to get that car into the race on Friday, the first day of qualifying. You know what? This was the first time he had ever driven a Grand National stock car, as well as the first time ever a race car. Robbie Robertson from Piedmont, West Virginia, attempted to get into the field. They put Dick into the car on Saturday, and he was able to qualify. Now, the original plan was for Dick May to step out of that car about halfway through this race. So at this point, because he's not been, of course, running up among the leaders, not exactly certain who's piloting it, but you may be looking at a man running his first weekend ever as a professional race driver. Dick May uh, 
was the 30th uh, starter, slowest qualifier, 106.002 miles an hour. Neil Bonnet, the leader, has been leading since lap number 191, and we're now at lap 324. And there's a rather unique situation regarding the engine of this car, Larry. Well, yeah, the uh, the heads that are on this car is something, of course, all the crews have been experimenting with. Uh, oh, it's a constant, ongoing battle. And uh, Lee Shepard is a man who was involved in trying to fine-tune and hone heads. And among the selection of heads that the Junior Johnson and the Neil Bonnet crew have experimented with in the past have been heads that were those that were de developed by Lee Shepard. Now, nobody knows exactly sure which ones might be in the car because you know, everybody is borrowing and stealing and trading heads for all, all the time to uh, find just that right combination. But at one point, there was some Lee Shepard research involved in this team. And you can see that Neil Bonnet is just about to lap the sixth place car of Dale Earnhardt. Let's get out of Jackaroot for some observations. Bob, it's going to be pit stop poker in about 30 laps. We heard Gary Nelson tell us that he is considering to do a gas and go. Remember one year ago when Ricky Rudd was in tremendous command of this race? In a late race caution, they decided not to take on tires. And you know, the whole brouhaha there, and you know, went to victory lane, that was Tim Richmond. Well, if this thing goes down under green, it's really going to be neat to see if Nelson goes with fuel, if he can make up the distance between himself and the leader, Bobby Allison distance and that of Neil Bonnet and also the question is if Allison pits first and does a gas and go what does Tim Brewer and company do for Neil Bonnet so there's a lot of strategy beginning to develop right down here on pit road and all of those questions about to be answered in the next 30 or so laps well some very interesting racing uh, we were seeing uh, just a few minutes ago as Neil Bonnet tried to lap Dale Earnhardt, and both cars getting a little squirrely there coming out of turn four. Yeah, they really did. And with the pit stop poker that Jack Aru was referring to, Bob, this is a relatively significant moment in this race because Earnhardt is now a lap down to the leader, Neil Bonnet. That means there are only five cars on the lead lap with 70 laps to go. We'll be right back with more live coverage from North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. Bonnet continues to lead, but we have a change of second position as Jeff Bodine has moved around Bobby Allison. Well, Bobby, you and I were kidding each other about 30 laps ago, and I said, hey, Bodine is really beginning to pressure Allison. He said, now, nah, they've been running that way for about a half hour. We had a million-dollar bet yep. that Bodine was going to pass in the next 10 laps. I think I lost that, but Bodine finally did get around. So it becomes a battle for second position here between Bodine and Bobby Allison. Bonnet enjoying a comfortable lead at this point, and there are only five other cars, four other cars besides himself on the lead lap. The interval between first and second is about a full straightaway. Third position, rather fourth position, is Terry Labonte, and fifth is Daryl Waltrip. That is the situation as we near the end of this race. Well, Neil Bonnet, I don't know if he's getting ready for a pit stop or if he's caught in the traffic, but Bonnet he is. He's coming, coming in. in. Neil Bonnet, the leader, is coming toward his pit. We will throw it down to Jack Aroot, who's in the Neil Bonnet pit. Jack? Well, the first ace is placed card up this time. They're going for right side rubber, the Neil Bonnet team, that is. You know, we said gas and go may be the decision that Gary Nelson's going to make. They've added the fuel. They're trying to refire the engine. They've dropped it from the jack, and it's stalled. Now they're going to push it, trying to get it back to fire. They do, and he's away. Yes, he's away now. Well, he isn't away yet, Jackie. They're still pushing, and now the car fires, and he moves away, but he lost a lap. Tough break for Neil Bonnet. In fact, the leader is on the back stretch, so it's a lap and a half. Well, now the strategy really begins to compound. What do you do if you're Bobby Allison's crew? What do you do if you're in Ricky Rudd's crew? What do you do if you're in Jeff Bodine's crew? You heard Gary Nelson say that you figure if you take the time to change rubber that you may lose about 40 or 50 laps of track time to catch up. We are almost within that window. So now a lot of decisions have to be made because the leader has sort of cast the die. He has changed rubber. And we are looking through the window right now of Kyle Petty as it gets clean. Here comes the leader, Jeff Bodine. We'll see if it's a gas and go for him or a change of rubber. He's stopping in the pit area. They do move to the right side of the car and will replace the rubber. Fuel also being dumped in. The windshield is being wiped off for the final few laps of this race. 
still working on the right side of the car, putting fresh rubber on. Here comes Bobby Allison going across the start-finish line and putting a lap on Jeff Bodine. Jeff moves out. Bobby Allison now has a lead. He's on the back stretch. And Neil Bonnet happened to get by Jeff as he entered the speedway in the bottom of turn one and two. Bodine is running about 30 car lengths behind Neil Bonnet on the racetrack. Once Allison pits, that's probably the difference between first and second unless Bobby can go in with a splash and go, as perhaps was suggested a few laps earlier by Gary Nelson. Well, that's a question that we will we'll answer here. Here's Levante coming long. in. Terry Labonte, the fourth place competitor, comes in for a stop. He slides the Piedmont Airlines car to a halt. Jimmy Means also going out. That was the orange streak that went by the bottom of your screen. Still working on the Terry Labonte car. It's a 12 and a half second pit stop for Terry, and he goes back out there. And he too took on right side rubber, so all three bonnet. Bodine and Labonte who were running in the first five have opted for the outside rubber. A little bit of a surprise. I kind of thought that somebody might go a different direction because the inside rubber can become so important here because you really need to jet off of turn number four and turn number two. There's the leader, Bobby Allison, but he has not made a pit stop and will have to before long. Darrell Waltrip comes in for a stop. He was running in fifth spot. And they're going to the left side of that car for new rubber. Waltrip, of course, the man who has been more successful at this racetrack than anybody in recent history. A very rapid fire pit stop on Darrell Waltrip, and I would suggest that he really picked up some ground on the racetrack. Of course, it's difficult to tell exactly how much ground he has picked up until the leaders come around, but Waltrip was very effective. Larry, now we're calling it guts poster because Gary Nelson has seen all the competition come in and, as you say, take right side rubber. He's standing on top of a tire, but he's got his jack man directly in front of him and the fellow that will carry two right side tires standing by. It's still a question mark whether it'll be a gas and go, but I would not want to be in Gary Nelson's position right now. And there is Gary watching very closely Bobby Allison out there on the racetrack. When will he be coming in for the stop? He's in turn number two right now. We got a spin in turn number one. What an advantage for Allison oh, if the caution boy. fly comes out. No kidding. It is going to come out, I believe, because Bobby Hillen, who spun over there in turn number one, is off of the racetrack. Now he begins to pull away, and there is no caution. So the break will not come for Bobby Allison. Boy, what a break it would have been, though, if the field had slowed down and Bobby would have been able to come in for a stop under caution. Well, and something else has happened. We're looking at Bobby Allison, who we are told will be coming in in two laps. Neil Bonnet, there you see in the bud car directly in front of him, has gone by Bobby and I think put himself on the same lap. So what we have set up now is that Allison almost ought to consider going ahead and changing the rubber anyway because Bonnet is obviously running much faster than Bobby, but can he go all the way around the racetrack in 50 laps? A lot of variables playing into the hand right now of both these drivers. It is going to be a race to the finish unquestionably here. We continue to watch Bobby Allison on the racetrack. One of the cars pulling out of the uh, pit area. Got a little high on the racetrack it looked like. Richard Petty by the way is back in that race car. When he pulled out the car got a little high and Allison and a couple of others had to go high to avoid hitting him. But Richard Petty back in the STP Pontiac after a few laps of relief driving from Buddy Baker. And there's another interesting fact. See that red and white car in the middle of your screen, Ricky Rudd? He's been kind of quiet while all this has been going on, but he's been in for his pit stop. He's back out. Look where he is, right on Neil Bonnet's back bumper. Now, Allison, the leader, is running right there on the racetrack. Those two guys in front of him now made up a lap, so they are on the same lap. But Ricky Rudd is now in a position also to pit well. Yellow flag coming out, Bob. And the yellow is out. We don't see a spin on the racetrack. There is debris between turns three and four. So the field will be slowed. Bobby Allison did wait long enough, and he'll be able to come in under caution. Now the question will become, can they get all the work done they want to before the field comes around, and will Allison exit the pits as the leader? Boy, Gary Nelson has really got to be scrambling around, not only with his little legs right now, but in his mind. What can we do under one lap or three quarters of a lap under a caution flag? They can certainly do a lot more than what you can do under a green flag condition. He's coming off of turn number four, down pit row, 
Bodine is right behind him. Bodine, who has already stopped once, is coming again. Yes, so is Daryl Waltrip. So is Terry Labonte. Here is Jack Aroot. Larry, it's become academic. Under the caution, you can take the luxury of changing outside tires. So Gary Nelson didn't have to make that hard decision. They've adjusted on the chassis, and they're working on the right side now. They've completed their work, and he's back underway. 15.4 seconds, an excellent stop under caution for the Dygard Miller team. Jeff Bodine pulling out. Bobby Allison is away. So is Terry Labonte, and so is Darrell Waltrip. Looks like Bobby Allison is the recipient of a pretty good situation here. Right now, we present an ESPN NASCAR track fact. talked before about the blueprint precision required for aerodynamics on a super speedway but on a short track you don't worry so much about it that smooth flow of air is not real essential on buddy baker's car you can see all they've done is taken a fender and put a plate over where the door handle used to be where the mirror used to mount and even on the window opening right here besides that on a short track the door usually just gets damaged anyway so why go to all that effort besides that the aluminum is a little lighter in weight than the bondo now the car has to weigh a minimum of 3700 pounds but just this little savings of weight allows you to reposition it really where you want it around the car. This is the way racing used to be. Well, almost. This track fact has been and all of a sudden, Jeff, down one lap. How's it look? That uh, looks pretty tough for me. Uh, trying to get the inside lane on Walter. But I should be over there, but he won't let me in there. What you need to do is stay ahead of Allison, right? Yeah, I need to stay ahead of everybody right now. Okay, Jeff, go some. Jeff, you start that position. You're in the lead lap. It's the tail end of the lead lap. You stay right where you are. It's okay. A conversation there between Jeff and his pit crew and a rather confused start here, to a breast start, because there were two lanes, and Bobby Allison, who is the leader of the race, uh, did not lead either lane across the start-finish line. Instead, Bodine and Waltrip were side by side. Now, the leader is Bobby Allison. There are three cars on the lead lap, and they're running right together. Bobby Allison, the leader, right behind him is Ricky Rudd in second, and right behind Rudd is Neil Bonnet. Those cars on the lead lap. Then it is Jeff Bodine, Terry Labonte, Daryl Waltrip, and Dale Earnhardt a lap down. Actually, Bob, I think that at least now for the current moment that uh, Waltrip and Jeff Bodine have made their way back under the lead lap. Of course, they're an entire well, yeah, length of the racetrack right. around, but uh, and here comes Earnhardt into the uh, pits. That's rather sudden. Quite some tight racing. Here's the restart from the Kyle Petty car. And look at the bumping going on out there as Dale Earnhardt got bumped in the front end and Kerry wow. Gant out of shape. Well, everybody was really out of shape, but it looked like the Dale took quite a wrap to the inside of that car, and he probably has a tire rub problem. Look at the battle for the lead here. There were three abreast across the line, and Ricky Rudd has gone into the lead. Neil Bonnet is second, Bobby Allison third. Now Bonnet wants the lead as he goes to the inside down the back stretch, and he goes into the lead. Neil Bonnet, now the leader with Rudd second and Allison third. Laps to go, it's beginning to look a little bit like deja vu from a year ago. Ricky Rudd being right up there, he was right up among the leaders and certainly a real pivotal player as we got down to the final stages of this race. But you know, Bob, the interesting thing is what if there is another caution flag? Just how fast are Bodine and Darrell Waltrip right now? Off of the corner, Neil Bonnet, the leader, and the laps are clicking off. We are up to 366 laps, 35 to go. Now Bobby Allison, who had that big decision, at least he and his team leader, Gary Nelson, a few laps ago, doesn't seem to really have the power right now to keep up with the two leaders, Ricky Rudd and Neil Bonnet. As Jack Aru pointed out during one of the breaks in our broadcast here, is that this caution flag coming out probably was more of an advantage to somebody like Neil Bonnet, who lost a lot of ground on the racetrack under green flag conditions because the car stalled as he was leaving the pit area. And of course, that caution flag allowed Neil to make up that lost ground on the racetrack. And right now, he is really making the most of it. And of course, another win for Junior Johnson here would move him into a tie for all-time car owner wins, tied with Petty Engineering. There's Ricky Rudd in second position in the Ford. So again, it is battled down to a 
Chevrolet versus Ford situation. The Chevy of Bonnet in the lead, the Ford of Ricky Rudd running second spot. Remember, it's General Motors and Ford are three and three up to this point in the race, so we do have definitely the rubber match on our hands, but Bonnet seems to be opening up a little bit of distance between himself and Ricky Rudd. And Bobby Allison trailing even further in third place, in fact, being uh, challenged by Terry Labonte. We'll be back with more live coverage after these messages. Neil Bonnet continues to show the way here at North Wilkesboro, and a spin up in turn number four will bring out a caution, Dick May. Spins and may have had some slight contact with the outer wall. Everybody splitting the dice and going high and low, trying to avoid hitting him. Looks like everybody will, but the yellow out once again. Let's go down to Jackaroot in the pit area. Well, until that caution was displayed, Bob and Larry, it looked as if Neil Bonnet had benefited the most from the, the green flag and caution periods. Because if you remember, Neil Bonnet was able to come into the pits and take on left side tires on his green flag stop. I, correct that, it was right side tires. During that last caution, he had the luxury of being able to come in and without a two lap penalty, also take on left side tires. So he had four brand new Goodyears on his car and he was able to go back out. Now they all come in and Bonnet's gonna be able to take on some additional tires. And I would have to bet that Bobby Allison will take on left sides as well as right sides this time. Well, Bob, here are a couple of facts. Allison was very slow with that set of tires during the last green flag lap, Jack. By the way, down in the pits, you probably couldn't see it, but everybody was running all over Bobby, so this is a big break for him. But guess who gets their lap back? Jeff Bodine and Darrell Waltrip are now caught back up, if you will, with the leaders. So depending upon what changes they make this time, both of them could be a very significant factor in the last 25 laps of this race. This could be a real shootout. That's a very good point. Neil, uh, rather, Daryl Waltrip is in for a stop, and so are, is Jeff Bodine. So both of those guys apparently are making their efforts to get back up front. Well, earlier we saw Kyle Petty at the mercy of the entire crew, or the entire uh, race field as he sat uh, there between three, three and four, but there you see the view he has as he goes to the outside of, again, we're not sure if that's Dick May or Robbie Robertson. You can see that the car uh, definitely had some tire problems, too. In any case, we are yellow for the fifth time this afternoon, and we will be back with more of our coverage of the Northwestern Bank 400 in just a moment. We are yellow once again. Jeff Bodine, you can see the right front of that car is flat, and he's also uh, had some other body damage or something dragging from the car. All of this happened up in turn number three uh, as they were uh, completing the first lap under green. Now, we have the in-car camera operated by Steve Freed, and this is what happened. There was all kinds of bumping and banging going on up there. Well, Jeff Bodine and Bobby Allison both dove for the same spot on the racetrack. They are both on the brakes hard. Kyle Petty was right in the thick of it. He, too, had to slow down, but Jeff making significant contact with Bobby Allison and the fenders rubbing against the uh, right outside of uh, Jeff Bodine's car. There's Bobby Allison making a pit stop. Also that crew checking over the condition of the race car, but everybody went for the same spot under the first lap of that green flag restart. Kyle, this is Bob Jenkins up in the ESPN booth. We had a real good shot of that uh, incident involving Jeff Bodine right ahead of you. What it looked like from your vantage point? Well, you haven't exactly had the greatest luck in this race today. How are your spirits right now? Not too bad, I don't care. For, no, we're running a pretty good race, even though we got spun that one time. The old cars drove pretty good all day, and it felt pretty good. We feel like we can finish, still have a decent finish out of it, keep up our points if we can last the last 30 or 40 laps. All right, and we've enjoyed the pictures you brought for us. Thank you. Terry Labonte is the man that's now on the catbird seat, so to speak. He is starting alongside of the leader, Neil Bonnet, on this restart. And you don't anticipate another caution flag flying in the next, in the last 20 laps of this race. Labonte would like to get ahead of Neil and try and get that lap back. He is one lap down, but the first three cars in the racetrack, Bonnet, Rudd, Waltrip, 20 laps to go. You know, the interesting thing about this most recent caution, it was caused by Jeff Bodine. He stopped down at the entrance to turn four, saw the yellow came out, and then started again, caught back up with the field, and did not lose a lap. So Jeff is still on the lead lap. 
but is uh, has quite a bit of traffic to come up through. The four to see now how bad that car is here, Bob. The four cars that are, the, are on the lead lap and up there battling for the lead. Neil Bonnet, Darrell Waltrip, Ricky Rudd, and Bobby Allison. And Darrell Waltrip looks like he is the strong man right now. Well, 20 laps ago, Darrell Waltrip was a lap down, and I think that 99% of the people in the stands here at North Wilkesboro would definitely have counted him out. But the way the race has unfolded, the moves that Darrell Waltrip and Junior Johnson and Jeff Hammond and all those guys have made, well, he may be the man to watch now. There is the leader, of course, Neil Bonnet, and now we have teammates ready to do battle. The Junior Johnson cars are up front with Bonnet and Waltrip in the driver's seat. Again, I continue to be impressed with the smart race strategy that Darrell Waltrip employs for just about every race he is in. He hangs back, doesn't show a whole lot of muscle, a whole lot of strength in the early and middle stages of the race. But when it comes down to time to move up and think about taking the checkered flag, Darrell Waltrip, unless he has wrecked or unless the car won't run, is usually always right there. And look how he's closing in on Neil Bonnet. He really is. And Bob, I'll tell you, I'm going to repeat something I said a couple of weeks ago on a late model sportsman race. Darrell Waltrip has won too many races in the last 10 years to call it luck. He has not won on the Winston Cup Trail this year so far. He has won a late model sportsman race. He won at Bristol, or rather at Darlington, the race that we televised for you on ESPN. But his best finish of the year was last weekend in Darlington in a Winston Cup race. He was second. He has two thirds, a third at Daytona and a third at Richmond. He is currently in the Winston Cup point standings. Walked off with the pole position here today for this race. And now is that far behind Neil Bonnet with 10 laps to go. Just 10 laps to go. Bob, what do you do if you're the owner of both of these cars? I guess you, <laughs> you take the headsets off, put them on the pit wall, and do like everybody else does, stand up and just watch. <laughs> and say, will the better man win? Oh, this could be a real good race in the finish. All right, it's time. Who's oh. going to win it, Larry? I'll tell you, you know, both cars, I, I lost a little bit of track because we had those two or three caution flags in rapid succession, but I would imagine both of them have four brand new tires on. I think Darrell is running a little quicker than Neil, but Neil certainly has position right now. It would be really tough to pick. I gotta go with Walter, Bob. I agree with you. Walter going high here in turn number one, finding that not the best route. So settling in behind now. Looking to the inside momentarily as they headed toward turn number three. I got to think that Daryl is going to win also. He moves inside, now coming off turn number four, but Bonnet outpowers him down the straightaway. They're running almost side by side and nose to tail. Now Waltrip again to the inside with less than seven laps to go. They move on to the back stretch. The fans are cheering for their particular driver. What a job that Neil Bonnet has. He only has to be perfect, and I mean by inches. He has to be perfect every single lap of this race. He is fixed to drive his heart out. You know, Waltrip has only led one lap of this race. Down to Jackie, who's with Junior Johnson. Junior, who do you pull for now with one, two? Are you for Waltrip or Bonnet? Well, it don't make no difference to me, but it would be pretty nice if Darrell win it, because that puts him on the winner's circle next year. I kind of like to see him be on it, but look, at this my best man win. Now there's a businessman. He's looking for the money. <laughs> <laughs> there's Bonnet in the lead, and there's Waltrip in second spot. They're running right together on the racetrack, but Darrell has not found the opportunity he needs to go around. They move down the straightaway. Again, they are side by side. Waltrip with the high line now in turn number two. These are teammates, but they're sure not acting like it on the racetrack. They're battling for supremacy. Bob, you just click off the radios. Everybody does, and let these two professionals do what they do best, and that is racing. Bonnet is obviously running slower than Darrell, but doing all that he can to try and keep the door closed high, keep the door low just close low, just three laps to go. He's back and forth in the racetrack. There's no dirty driving tactics going on here. These guys are just racing. Walter was fine, trying to find just that half a horsepower edge on Neil. A little bump there coming off of the second corner down the back stretch. Darrell wants Neil to know that he's back there. There are now two laps to go. The white flag will come out next time around. Waltrip again, high on the racetrack. That's not the fast line. Waltrip Settles back into second. Now they head down the back stretch and into turn number three. Dick May, the slow car, right ahead of them. 
may cause some problems again a bump by Darrell Walter if they come off the fourth corner Harold Kinder waves the white flag there's one to go now because Neil has been running so relatively slow Allison and Rudd are closing up too if these guys get together in turn three and four could it be Rudd or Allison they're right together also and to turn number three Neil Bonnet still has the lead but Darrell Waltrip is going to make one final bid to the inside now he looks low to the inside coming off the corner he's not going to be able to do it Neil Bonnet wins Waltrip second spot in third place it is Ricky Rudd and fourth Bobby Allison although they cross almost side by side and we may have to check the official scoring to determine who finished third I but think that may have been Allison who got third Bob because they were very close too as you said Junior Johnson wins with Bonnet and finishes second with Darrell Waltrip. This is the battle for third place now, Larry. Allison is to the outside, and Ricky Rudd is inside. Well, they're side by side coming out of turn number four. Allison sliding up. Doesn't look like he has enough momentum, but he stays with it. He does not get out of the throttle. He just gets a headlight ahead of Ricky Rudd as they go across the finish line. And you know something? There are still are only three different people who have won a Grand National Race in 1985. Remember that Bonnet already has won once. Neil Bonnet has pulled into victory lane, and Jackie Arute will be there to talk with Neil in just a moment. We'll be back for that after these messages. As easy as everybody thought, was it? Jackie, we were having so many troubles there, probably nobody knew about it. The motor wouldn't turn under 7,000 RPM, and it'd go dead. And I had to just run it in the ground all day. J.B. Rains, what did the motors just run super? We just had something wrong with the carburetor, and, and on the restarts it wouldn't take off. When I pit it, go dead. We just keep could keep the motor running. Just tickle it to death to win the thing. You made that green flag stop, and it looked like it was going to be your last one, and the engine died. What were your thoughts right then? Well, I knew I'd been having trouble all day on the restarts and everything, and I just felt like if we could get the thing going, the car had shown us all day long that it was capable of coming back to the front. You know, the Budweiser people, the good year worked with us with the tires. Everything went perfect. It's just the kind of deal where I felt like we could overcome that one little obstacle. We could win the race. A departure from last year, no victories, and now you've won on a super speedway and a short track. Has this team arrived? Jack, I tell you, they have, and I could take the victories and throw them away. What I like, running up front, being competitive, and the victories are the things you enjoy about it, but I like racing up front more than anything. Your thoughts? When you looked in your mirror and you saw Darrell Waltrip, is that who you wanted to race for this one? Darrell's the guy that wins all the races up here. He's sitting in a car just like mine, but he was hitting on all eight cylinders most of the time. So I knew I had my hands full, and I had to go from offense to defense the last 10 laps of the race. And Darrell's kind of guy is hard to hold back. It's a lot of fun at the end of the race. Bob, Larry, it's obvious that Neil Bonnet has arrived as part of the Junior Johnson team. He's brought one home to Ronda, North Carolina. Led 213 laps out of 400 here this afternoon. And, uh, boy, the, the winner's list, as you said, uh, Larry, isn't very long this year. Elliott, Earnhardt, and Bonnet, the only winners in seven races this year in Winston Cup. You know, Neil said that he went from offense to defense the last 10 laps. That really was an excellent race, the last 10, 15 laps of this race. Two guys showing a lot of respect for one another. They banged it against each other a number of times during the last 10 laps, but they both were in complete control at all times, and it really was a beautiful race, and that's the kind that you, you kind of hate to see one of those two guys lose. People leave the Junior Johnson grandstand over at the end of the backstretch and begin to head home, but it's been a great day for Junior Johnson. His drivers, first and second. Neil Bonnet, the winner, and Darrell Waltrip in second position. We'll be back to check the race summary, tell you about the average speed and how many yellows and so forth, right after these messages when we come back to North Wilkesboro. Back at North Wilkesboro, where the race has been won by Neil Bonnet. Our race summary showed that there were five cars finishing on the lead lap, and there were 12 lead changes among six drivers. The time of the race, two hours, 39 minutes. The average speed, 93.818 miles an hour. We had six caution periods and 35 laps run under caution, but nothing that even came close to a serious accident. Now, as far as the final uh, results are concerned, the winner, of course, Bonnet. Second, Darrell Waltrip. In third position, Bobby Allison. Fourth was Ricky Rudd. And fifth place was Jeff Bodine. Unofficially in sixth, the lap down was Bill Elliott. And in seventh was Terry Labonte. Well, I think Jeff Bodine earned that fifth position on his own, if you know what I mean, in regards to that last caution flag. 
But you know something interesting, for the second year in a row, we've seen a guy win here at North Wilkesboro for the very first time in his career. And finally, after all these years, the number of active drivers who have career wins here at North Wilkesboro is beginning to expand. It's gone from three to five in the last 12 months. The Northwestern Bank 400 from North Wilkesboro.